I'm not expecting. We are running there. I literally can only see the Sesame Street songs. Mm -hmm. Sesame Street. Oh, okay. Because I used to sing that to my kids. I normally need something to go in the background so I can say the key. That's usually the age. If I need to get rid of my food, we're going to be all. Call to order this uh, regular monthly meeting of the MATC District Board. Would you call the roll, please? Director Baker? Uh, here. Director Burris? Present. Director Case? Here. Director Foley? Here. Director Mendez Ramos? Here. Director Laura Mukunde? Here. Director Nanji? I haven't seen it yet. Director Moore, Sorry. Owen Moore. Here. And Director Pence. Here. Okay, let's watch to see if Dr. Najib joins us and note when he does. Uh, obviously, we have a quorum. Uh, are we in compliance with the open meeting rules? Yes, we are in compliance. First uh, item on the agenda is comments from the public. And uh, the start board policy A0107 states, quote, no person may speak more than once to an issue or for a period longer than five minutes, except upon the consent of the majority of the district board. No more than three people may be heard to one side of an issue, except upon the consent of the majority of the district board. During public comment, the board will not engage in public discussion regarding personnel matters. And the first person is Levita Booker. Would you come forward, please? Yes, I'm Levita Booker. I'm a 62-year-old student. Only reason he's reading this for me, I have dyslexia, and I read stuff backwards, and it takes me a very long time to read. But I am a 4.0 student, so don't think that disability is stopping me. But I know I practiced reading it, and it took me like eight minutes. So I know I don't have eight minutes, so I asked somebody to read it for me. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Elsa. Uh, how's it going? Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Lydia Booker. I'm a 62-year-old returning student that is currently pursuing an associate degree at the college. Up until November 14th, 2023, my time at the college had been without incident. I am focused and determined to achieve my educational goals and have so far consistently upheld a commendable academic record, which is demonstrated by my current semester 4.0 GPA and my previous semester GPA of 3.75. My MATC experience took a sharp turn for the worst on November 14th, 2023, when I was verbally accosted by an environmental services employee of European descent that I had not previously known. While waiting for my work study supervisor outside of the M building basement level bathroom, this employee invaded my personal space and pointed her finger in my face, called me profane names, leaving me shocked and feeling threatened. I verbally responded by telling her what would happen if she did not get out of my face, my emotional response caught the attention of a couple of building services employees that were walking further down the hall towards the building services office. They only heard my side of the exchange. I alerted the employee to the security camera positioned down the hallway, assuming it had captured the entire interaction. In an instant, her in initial defiant demeanor shifted to distress and then tears as she gradually grasped the possibility for actions being recorded. Witnessing her attempt to avoid accountability and portray herself as the victim by shedding tears resonated deep with me, as it is a well-documented tactic often employed against Black people. Seeking support, I immediately attempted to file a complaint regarding the employee's conduct, but was rejected by 
the employee supervisor who dismissed my concerns and re my repeated visits to the HR office yielded promises to follow up that never happened. The investigation conducted by Dione Green in HR and Michelle Lamar in judicial affairs unjustly portrayed me as the aggressor, disregarding my account of being verbally accosted. It was determined that I randomly approached this unknown employee and made an unprovoked threat. Despite being a model student with no prior disciplinary issues, I faced excessive punishment that included the following. I was placed on disciplinary suspension pending investigation for 21 days from school, even though the student code of conduct states that suspensions are reserved for cases that presents an immediate and definite danger. I was not an immediate and definite danger to anyone, and this was not a situation that involved any physical violence. Additionally, the student code of conduct states that a student can be placed on disciplinary suspension for only up to 10 days pending investigation. I was suspended for 21 days. I was also suspended from my work study job for 45 days. I was released by Michelle Lamar in judicial affairs to return to work in December 2023, put on suspension again by HR in January 2024 for the same offense after working two weeks. And finally, on February 12th, 2024, more than two months after the situation occurred, Dione Green in HR terminated me from my work study job and permanently banned me from working at the college, preventing me the opportunity to earn my federal work study money and depriving me of the essential financial support to help pay for my college expenses. Lastly, I was put on disciplinary action for the entire spring semester, and I was made to pay $35 to take an online conflict class. This illustrates that the judicial, the judicial system is unfair and biased. The college holds, or two, the college holds students accountable to rules, policies, and procedures that they do not follow themselves, or they make up procedures when there are none. Three, HR treats students like they are employees and holds them accountable to policies that are contained in the employee handbook only. They conduct separate investigations and may issue additional sanctions other than what is issued by judicial affairs for the same offense. Furthermore, HR does not follow policies and procedures outlined in the student code of conduct, even though it has been determined by the college to be the governing document for student conduct. I urge the board to require reforms aimed at fostering openness, accountability, and fairness within the judicial affairs process. Does the board know how many students go through the judicial process or how many students are suspended for how long and what reasons? Could there be a committee established to review this data quarterly and report back to the board? There is a pressing need for more oversight to ensure compliance to policies, eliminate biases, and safeguard students' rights. The current practice of subjecting students to separate disciplinary processes by both judicial affairs and HR is unacceptable. The HR's involvement should be limited to employee matters, not only, and not student disciplinary proceedings involving alleged misconduct. In conclusion, I recently learned that my experience, unfortunately, echoes those of other students who have also been wronged by these flawed systems. It's critical that action be taken to correct these systemic shortcomings and restore trust in the college's administration processes. Thank you for your time and hopefully your action regarding this very important matter. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much. Thank you. Next is Lynette. I think it's Harvey. Did I get that right? Welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. My name is uh, Lynette Harvey. I'm an advisor here at MATC. I'm also the vice president for the paraprofessionals of Local 212. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Taisha McGregory. I'm a missions navigator. I work in admissions office. I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch your first name. Kaisha McGregory. Okay, please be a little louder. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank Kaisha you. McGregory, and I work in a, as an admissions navigator in the admissions office, and I've been here for about five years. Thank you. Okay, so um, a member wanted, she was unable to attend, and she wrote a statement that I wanted to read on her behalf. Her name is Lenita Sally. Um, this There's involving a group of employees, about five or six employees, whose jobs were told that they were going to be eliminated um, right before Christmas break. And they said, once you come back, you're gonna have a new job as an advisor. Well, when they came back, it's been, uh, okay, we don't know when you're gonna start. We don't know when you're gonna start. Okay, you're gonna start in March. 
okay, no, you're going to start in July or, or August. Well, recently, you are no longer going to be considered for an advisor position, which was a promotion. You are now going to be a different role, which is a mission specialist, which is a demotion, and you have two weeks to decide. Or you no, know, you have until April 2nd to decide if you're going to take this new demotion or if you're going to give your two weeks notice. This is just how it's been ha handled. And so there are a lot of people who are concerned and confused and the situation's been happened very poorly. And I think kicking the can down the road to say, we'll do better. It has to start somewhere and keeping promises to do better, but never doing better is really unfortunate. And this is her letter. To whom it may concern, my name is Lenita Sally and I'm an admissions navigator. I've been with the college for 11 years. We had a meeting today, which included the admissions navigators, um, our direct supervisor, uh, other supervisors and a member of HR. Then the invite for the meeting was sent yesterday after 9 p.m. I'm a local 212 employee and that noticed that there was no one in the meeting from the union to represent me. After speaking with Sam Froyland, the labor director, he said that he was not aware of the meeting and this could be because of the time the invite was sent at such a late hour. I am very distraught about the meeting uh, that occurred today. Initially, we were told that we would be placed in college advisor roles because the mission navigator role was going to be eliminated. Today at the meeting, we were informed by my immediate supervisor that the admission navigator role will still be eliminated and that the only other option is to become an admission specialist or to give two weeks notice. Currently, I work 40 hours per week. The admission specialist role is only 38.75. I was told that my current hourly pay will remain the same, but due to the reduction of my hours per week, that would be a substantial decrease in my overall pay. I was also told that the admission specialist position is the only position that was available for me to transition into. I filed multiple complaints at the college for different reasons involving hostile work environment, disparate treatment, and discrimination. The college has yet to address these issues. After I filed a complaint, I was rushed into a meeting where we told our jobs were going to be eliminated. I feel this was in pure retaliation uh, after I filed my complaint. Uh, my current supervisor is under investigation pertaining to my complaints. She was promoted and while she's currently under investigation. The union has been left out of various meetings. We've had to convey information to the union after the fact. It seems as if the missions navigators have no support. The work has been devalued and it's given them a poor reputation and something needs to be done. Thank you, Lenita Sally. Thank you. Thank you. I attended the meeting today. Go, go ahead. Okay. I attended the meeting today and I just have a question. If our if our roles will be eliminated, I just want to know if there, there are other um um jobs that can be looked at, other positions. You know. Well, uh, we can't address that here. Um and uh tell me who she should address that question to. Yeah, yeah. Um I would go to HR and I'll I'll help do that. Okay. So that you can come to me and okay. I'll get your HR. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next, I'm having a little trouble reading this. I think the name is Vita Cross. Vita Cross. Part-time faculty. Oh, there. Sorry, didn't see it coming. Hi. Welcome. Good afternoon. Did, did I get your last name right? My name is Vita Cross. Okay. You got the first name. Thank you. But good afternoon, members of the board and President Martin. My name is Vita Cross again. I'm a part-time instructor here at MATC. I'm also a member of the part-time faculty council of Local 212. My goal here is to share with you details from the part-time faculty Pi Day Rally that took place on March 14th, 2024. March 14 was MATC's non-student contact day. 
The non-student contact day is a day for MATC faculty and deans to meet and discuss important matters. And many part-time faculty, including myself, attended those meetings without compensation. The Pi Day rally was a day to express support and address issues that involve part-time instructors. Although it was cold and rainy on March 14th, the rally was a success because many people um, came together, approximately 50, to support our needs. So my statement is very brief and I'd like to thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. I dropped my pen, so let me grab it. Next is Lisa Kahneman. Hello. Don't worry, this is not a quiz, mm -hmm. although it does involve a grad. Mm -hmm. You can hand those out. For those of you that are um, virtual, I apologize. I was just thinking face to face, and so I will get um, the handout to you. Uh, Chairperson Foley, board directors, President Martin, colleagues, students, and community members, good afternoon. I hope this day finds you well and that you're not missing the snow too much. I'm here today in follow-up to remarks I made before you in January, where I shared five areas of concern voiced by our members related to the state of compensation at METC. Transparency, equity, accuracy, manageability, competitiveness, and predictability. The last being the focus of my remarks today. In January, I shared that since approval of the new open range compensation system, and the start of its implementation across 2019 to 2020, we have been hard pressed to find many examples of upward movement of frontline employees on the current pay structure over time that is not tied to the cost of living adjustments or COLA, AKA true progression. Employees responding to our issues of concern outreach in fall expressed frustration and even anger for having been stuck on the pay scale with no real movement for years. You heard a similar story told in heartfelt fashion by a well-respected colleague, I believe from the accounting program not too long ago. Further spurred by similar stories and other pathways, as you were alerted to in January, Local 212 filed an open records request for data identifying how many employees in each of our four bargaining units, full-time faculty, part-time faculty, paraprofessionals and MPBS engineers and production specialists had experienced true progression over the last 4.5 years. I brought a handout for you to enjoy, if not now, then later, right? The data obtained provide striking support that concerns and personal narratives of METC's frontline employees are indeed valid. As you can see, only a handful of the 1,300 to 1,500 employees 212 represents on any, any given semester experienced true movement on the pay structure since the last owed step increase from the old system was distributed in the spring of 2020. To put things in perspective, for METC's approximate 500 full-time faculty, that was only eight people over six and a half terms. These data explain why, in addition to the difficulties METC continues to have attracting and landing qualified job applicants, we are seeing highly qualified and much needed mid-career colleagues walk out the door and hearing of others who are considering or actively looking right now to do the same. Therefore, on behalf of those Local 212 represents of all frontline METC employees, I once again am calling for a truly collaborative evaluation of the current compensation structure and its functions, including a special focus on progression, movement through the system, an approach that invites, encourages, and empowers thoughtful analysis to ID and improve pieces that work, support the implementation of promising approaches that are in the works, as well as creative problem solving to vision and vet needed changes that will allow METC to meet both the staffing needs of today's very complex employment environment 
and with continued collaborative effort, the opportunities and challenges of the future. And by the way, one last thing. Considering METC's very impressive reserve numbers, reported very strong investment gains, as well as improvements in student FTEs and retention, the college can afford acknowledging and supporting those who work with students every day, who serve our student population. They and the communities from which they come are depending upon it. Thank you. Thank you. I have Elsa's name here again. Are you still in the room, Elsa? There you go. Um, is it acceptable if I read off of my laptop? Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'll keep it brief again. Um, I, I've been here before. We're talking about West Town of Green again. Uh, yeah, this goes. Um, it's good to see you all. Um, today, I, I just wanted to bring up that uh, we are still out here. Um, we're still advocating on this issue. Uh, I appreciate you all for taking the time to read the report last time. Um, that was something that we put a lot of work into. And so that, that's something that's important to us. It represents a lot of stories from students. Uh, but we also want to reaffirm that we do think West Ham Green is a good thing. Um, the students are very happy that there is an option for student housing. It's very unique for a community college to offer that. It gives students a, um, a taste of the traditional college experience while in a two-year institution, which primarily you know, doesn't offer that sort of thing. Um, but there are still problems there that we would like to see solved. Uh, one of these things that was suggested um, in a meeting with uh, uh, a president here, uh, Dr. Eva Martinez Prowlis, uh, was that there would be a liaison position between the college and the building. Um, short of the college uh, have, running its own student housing program, which may or may not be affordable, um, this, I believe, is the, is the best step going forward. And uh, students would like to be involved in that uh, process of making that uh, position. Uh, we already have some ideas from students we've talked to, and uh, that includes some of the following. Uh, the creation of the position, uh, is the liaison should be dedicated to working at the building full time, or at least 75% of the time. Um, there's a lot going on at the college, and so it's very easy, I think, for uh, people in some of these positions to get stretched thin and uh, given other tasks outside of their normal job. I, I know we all uh, recognize that and have been in that situation, but we do believe that if this position is created, it should be dedicated primarily to uh, West Town Green and work there. Um, the liaison should be the point of contact with for student workers in the building. Um, as it currently stands, the student workers or CAs uh, work under the supervision of the property manager. Uh, many of the problems in that building stem from a lack of communication between the college, property management, and students. Um, and that many, uh, I think, like cooks in the kitchen, they say, um, can lead to some issues that don't need to be there. And if uh, this creates a clear chain of command uh, with the college, uh, which leads into the next point, which is that the liaison uh, should be held to accountable to the standards of MATC. Um, it's unclear uh, from some meetings with students and meetings with faculty um, if the actions of the third party managing the building are held accountable to MATC's values. Um, a core value of the college as written in our mission statement reads that equity is a strategic priority for the college and inclusion is one of our values. The liaison should champion these values as a representative for the college within the building. Uh, it also reads our mission, uh, education that transforms lives, industry and community, our vision, the best choice in education where everyone can succeed. Um, and I believe that this should be brought into housing and other work that the college is doing in the community. Um, we believe they should also participate in diversity and conflict resolution training uh, for the CAs and the liaison, um, working with uh, building management to promote events. Um, as I said earlier, uh, this gives students at MATC a taste of the traditional college experience. Um, and we believe that this liaison grants the college an opportunity to create a more unified living environment. Um, and I also would like them to represent students who are uh, facing evictions. As mentioned in the report, um, I don't think evictions should be on the table for students barring some uh, violent incidences or threats of violence or behavior that violates safety. Um, however, if that is not feasible for the situation, um, I believe students should be represented by a, a staff member who's dedicated to that. Um, and finally, um, we're working on some more reports and trying to work with uh, some other elected officials beyond the, the school. Um, but I, 
as housing market is going crazy, and I think it's something we probably are all able to acknowledge, uh, housing is becoming a more and more difficult concern for students, especially a lot of our students, which as we understand are maybe some of, on the lower income side of things. So um, I think that this is a really good opportunity for uh, to help our community, help our students. I, I applaud MATC for the West Down Green Initiative, uh, but we'd like to see that expanded and we'd like, uh, I don't know, hopefully we can get some more funding, I guess, for that. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is the last uh, person who has signed up for public comments. So we'll move on to the next agenda item. Um, first, um, thank you all for addressing the board and sharing your concerns. The board will not be responding to any matter in adherence to the state of Wisconsin open meeting law, which prevents a governmental body from discussing any specific item that was not publicly noticed on the agenda. Uh, next is approval of minutes from uh, the regular board meeting of February 27, 2024, and the special board meeting March 15, 2024. I would entertain a motion to approve both and then see if there's any discussion about either. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Sure. I'll second. Motion by Director Burris, second by Director Baker. Uh, does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns about the minutes of the February 27th board meeting? Uh, seeing none, um, did you note that Dr. Najib has joined us? Thank you. Uh, the next question is, are there any comments, questions, et cetera, about the minutes of the special board meeting for March 19, 2024? Seeing none. Uh, there's a motion and a second to approve the minutes. Would all those in favor indicate that by saying aye? Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries. Next is approval of the consent agenda items. Again, I would request a motion for approval of all the consent agenda items. Uh, if there are specific items that need to be uh, broken out, uh, we will uh, do that. Um, so is there a motion to approve the consent agenda items? So yes. A motion by Director Case. And Dr. Najib, can I take that as a second? Second, yeah, fine. All right, are there any items uh, that we want to pull out of the consent agenda items? Director Baker. Yeah, I have an item in procurement that I'd like to uh, discuss. Which one? Uh, the second item, our restorative justice consultant district-wide. Would you like me to explain my issue give me just a second and see okay. if there are any others are there are there any other uh issues that need direct attention in the consent agenda items okay director baker go ahead yeah i'm just a i'm i'm i know this has been a long process that the district has been involved in and um i'm excited to see us moving forward with this i'm uncomfortable with entering into a seven year almost half million dollar potentially contract with a vendor that we haven't worked with before. Um, and I know that this is seeking approval, you know, action from us that um, could be up to seven years, but not necessarily that. And so I'd like just a little more conversation about this. Is this something we could do as a one year and then review or a two year? Because it is a uh, consultant that we have not worked with before. It just seems like sort of a long Long stretch. Um, so, sure, you want to answer. So, um, with regard to that contract, what was presented to the board was actually the proposal from the vendor, um, and I have not had an opportunity to negotiate with the vendor. However, it is my understanding that internally, our um, decision was to ask for a one year contract up front and then look at doing subsequent one-year renewals based on performance I, uh, and if i can follow up sure. I, I i that would have resolved the, the item that is presented to the board is um, an item that gives us background information from matc hr and dei offices and I that sort of explains all of this and then says positive action by the METC board will result in a purchase from restorative justice practices in Longmont, Colorado for a cost of 
thousand dollars, sixty five thousand annually for up to seven years. So if I had seen something that said one year, I would have just approved a consent agenda. <laughs> so can I, we change this now, or can we include that caveat or whatever? Yes, that will be included in the terms of the agreement. That it will be for one year with the with our option to add additional years. Correct. How okay. Do, um, do I have, do we have to change the language that's in here in terms of what we're? I think using? we do. Um, I think uh, what we probably should do is remove this from the consent agenda items. Take a vote on the remaining consent agenda items, and then entertain a motion to approve this uh, with modifications to what was presented. Does okay. anyone have? an issue with proceeding on that basis. Nope. All right, so let's then return to all of the consent agenda items except the restorative justice contract. What is the name of the vendor again? Uh, um, it is Restorative Justice Practice of Longmont, Colorado. Okay, so uh, other than the restorative justice practice uh, uh, item in the procurement report, uh, is there any further discussion about the consent agenda items? All right, there being none, um, and I'm sorry, I forgot who made the motion in the second. Director Case, did you make this motion? And then Director Najib seconded. Uh, would, yes. all those in, would, uh, would all those in favor of approving the consent agenda items other than the restorative justice practice item indicate that by saying aye? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the consent agenda items are handled. Is there a motion uh, to approve the restorative justice practice contract? Uh, and then we'll see if there's an amendment. Sure, I'll move the restorative justice consultant contract um, as written, except for the last uh, sentence of it, and that instead be replaced with a one-year contract with the ability of the college to renegotiate the future. Second. Um, any discussion about this item in the room? Any discussion from the directors online? No. All right, then... Uh, uh, we have a motion uh, by the director. Uh, actually, I still I did not uh, just understand the purpose of that uh, uh, contract. Can somebody just expand a little bit uh, for my understanding? Sure. Uh, Sherry, would that be you? So the purpose of the restorative... Would, would you identify yourself for the... Yeah. For the uh, Michael Rogers, um, Interim Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Uh, the purpose of the restorative justice contract is to have a vendor come to MATC to um, facilitate a restorative justice process to um, interview members of the campus community, understand the culture, and build some restorative justice practices to uh, bridge a gap between some of the challenges that have been expressed um, by members of the campus community over the years. And so that vendor will come in and facilitate that entire process for us. Dr. Najib, you have any follow-up questions? So we don't have any process right now to, to do that uh, between the faculty, the teachers. Uh, the, we don't have any system to do that. We have to have an uh, outside agency to do it for us. Well, that, that predates the context behind it, predates me being here, but... I can't hear him good. Dr. Martin, do you want to explain yeah. what this is about? I, I don't, yeah, he couldn't hear what Michael said. Um, right, I think that um, we had talked with the um, different uh, parties that were involved in con expressing concerns. We tried to resolve it internally ourselves first, um, using a lot of different methods. And then we decided it would be better to have someone from the outside to help facilitate that process. Um, that it would seem, um, to have a person with a different lens perspective that could really lead us uh, further a lot faster. Does that help? Anything for, uh, yeah. further, Dr. Nanji? So I, I agree with the really having just one year to see if it's really uh, 
it's gonna work or not, uh, and maybe we can revisit it in in, in after a few months and review some cases and see if it's really making a difference. Can we get a report on this as they're working through this? Well, we may want to get a report, report after they've finished working right, through yeah. it and yeah. see what the outcomes were mm -hmm. rather than interim reports. But sure, we can ask for that. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or comments by members of the board in the room? Yeah, let me just say one other thing. I mean, I, I I didn't mean to be a roadblock by putting this up. I, I think it's a very positive thing. I want to commend all of the parties um, involved um, who have you know worked very hard to try and find a common ground where people can agree on um, a a you know someone who can come in and work with um, administrators, work you know sort of all up and down um, the college on the issue. And I know that this has been a long road, and so. Um, my only objection was the length of the contract, but I really do applaud the effort on everyone's part. Anything else? Uh, seeing no other comments or questions, uh, we have a motion by Director Baker and a uh, second by Dr. Najib. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you second. My apologies, Director Burris. Dr. Burris. Maybe one day, not today. Uh, would all those in favor of approving the contract with the modification that it be for one year with options for subsequent years and that we will receive a report um, within the first year uh, to see if it is worth continuing? Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Item is approved, subject to those conditions. Uh, next item is resolution F0305-03-24, authorizing the sale of $1.5 million in general obligation promissory notes. Series 2023 to 2024 J of the Milwaukee Area Technical College District, Wisconsin. Is uh, Jordan Thoreau here tonight? Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. I'd love to move that motion. Can you talk about it? Yep. Hold on. <laughs> Is there a motion to approve? Uh, I would move approval of the motion. Is mm. there a second? Second. All but right. So we've... I'm sorry. That's a lid after the G. Okay. We have a motion by Director Baker, second by uh, Dr. Najib. Welcome. Tell us about the uh, sale. Right. Thank you, board, for having me. Uh, my name is Jordan Thoreau from Baird. I am filling in uh, for Justin Fisher. Um, so, should we? Um, so going through the results, uh, this morning we got four bids um, for your 1.5 million uh, GOP mystery notes. Um, this time last month, uh, the true interest cost was 3%. Um, in terms of now, we're at a 3.189%. 3 um, so it's slightly above 3%, but it's pretty consistent with prior sales. Uh, in terms of the four bids, so the difference between the first bid and the, and the last bid is only 10 basis points. So really that 10 basis points tells me that these are very competitive bids for the district. Also, the same bidders that bid last month have also bid multiple times. So in terms of Fidelity won last month, as well as Huntington Securities, TD Securities, Minority Securities, have been involved multiple months um, for prior issues. So this really shows that they're very interested in continually bidding on, on your debt every month. Um, so that's it for the, for the results. In terms of the overall issue summary, uh, it, on April 10th, so that's that's when you'll receive the funds. Uh, the principal amortization starts from June 1st, 2025 to 2028. So just your normal five-year amortization uh, that the district has been doing for multiple years. Uh, your first interest payment is yeah. on 12-1 of 24. Um, and then your Moody's rating is AA1 stable. So that's been... Um, consistent. 
Uh, so in terms of that, moving on to, I'm not going to talk too much on the overall financing plan. Uh, it's just basically keeping consistent with uh, targets set out by Ava and her team. Uh, so nothing has really, really changed with that. Um, so that's, that's that for your um, results. Any questions? Any questions in the room? Any questions by the directors online? Mr. Chair? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could you um, speak to the uh, ratings rationale of the new report? Sure. And strong financial position. So, yeah, so they, so Moody's looks at um, residential income. They look at pretty much everything. So what they look at basically is um, they've been noticing that your enrollment has stabilized. Um, they're seeing that um, reserves have been growing. So uh, if your reserves are about 46% fund balance as a percentage of revenues, which is strong. Um, also, your long-term liabilities is less than 250%. Um, um, so it's actually less than 200% of revenue. So those are just some positives that they're seeing. Uh, I've looked at past ratings reports. There's really no changes um, since they released their credit opinion. Uh, so overall, nothing has really changed. So this is your question. This is our accreditation as an institution. Yeah. So every every bot or every note sale, they will issue a credit rating. So Justin and, and Ava will go on a rating call and discuss the positives um, you know, with Moody's. And then they'll go ahead and, and rate those notes, that note issue. So they'll do that every every time that the district issues notes. So it's your opinion that we're in a good place. Yes, okay. absolutely. Any other questions in the room? Any questions from the directors online? There being none, we have a motion to approve the sale by Director Baker and a second by Dr. Najib. Uh, would you call the roll, please? Director Burris? Aye. Director Case? Aye. Director Menya Torino? Aye. Director Moore Mukunde? Aye. Director Najib? Aye. Director Owen Moore? Aye. Director Pence? Aye. Director Baker? Aye. Director Cohen? Aye. Motion passes. Next is resolution F0306 03 24 authorizing the issuance of $1.5 million in general obligation promissory note series 2023-2024K of Milwaukee Area Technical College District, Wisconsin. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. We have a motion by Director Mantia Ramos. Thank you. And a second by Director Burris. Uh, Mr. Thoreau, this is... Uh, I guess the question is anything different about the upcoming sale that we need to be aware of? No, just your normal million and a half note sale. Any questions in the room about this resolution? Any question by the members online? Seeing none, uh, we have a motion to approve from Director Mendia Ramos. A second by Director Burris. Would you please call the roll? Director Case? Aye. Director Mendia Aye. Director Warren Kennedy? Aye. Director Nijee? Aye. Director Owen Moore? Aye. Director Pence? Aye. Director Baker? Aye. Director Burris? Aye. Director Poland? Aye. Resolution passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Next agenda item is a policy review of the financial aid policy F0307-03-24. Uh, is uh, Ava Martinez Pellis here? She is. Welcome. Yes, I am here. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so today I have my colleague uh, Joshua Mantavan with me today. We are presenting the return of Title IV funds, R2T4 financial aid policy, and I believe this is the first review. And uh, Joshua, would you like to provide a quick snapshot of what it is and some of the changes? Sure. Um, MATC goes through a process every five years called recertification with the Department of Education. As part of that review, they go through a number of policies, and one of those policies is our calculation of when a student withdraws from school, how much federal student aid have they earned? And they call this the return to Title IV, R2T4. So this has already been sent a version of this policy to the Department of Education. They had some recommendations uh, for updates to the language included in there. It didn't really change how we're processing those calculations, but there were some verbiage changes that they wanted to see in our policy before they would approve it for recertification. So this is uh, the updates that we've made to comply with those recommendations from the Department of Education. And please, and please forgive me, I forgot to mention Joshua's title. He is our uh, Executive Director of Financial Aid and has been at the MATC community for a couple of months. Is it two months? Jim, we are sorry. very, very happy that Joshua is joining our community. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I just want to clarify, you said this is the language that they suggested or you got it updated to the language that they suggested? It has now been updated to the language that was recommended, yes. Uh, just to clarify that, we're, we're looking at a red line draft. So everything that's in the red is what they uh, directed or, or requested. Which is it? Are they telling us what it has to be or are they asking us to do this? Um, I would say that they're asking us to do it, but I think that in order for it to be approved, we would have to have these things within our policy. Okay. They're not telling us that we have to, but that if we want to be recertified, then we would need to make those updates. Okay. Yes, I would agree. Yeah. Any questions or comments about this? We're not being asked to approve this tonight. This is just the first review. This will come back to us in April for review, or for, I'm sorry, approval or non-approval. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next agenda item are monthly reports. On uh, February 26th to 28th, uh, I attended the American Public Television Station's Public Media Summit in Washington, DC. I was joined at the summit by our station manager, Debbie Hamlet, um, who's Vice President and General Manager of Milwaukee PBS. Uh, the APTS Public Media Summit is the largest annual gathering of public broadcasting, general managers, and community leaders who come together to explore issues that are vital to the future and mission of public media service, including PBS uh, and uh, uh, all those shows you like to watch on channels 10 and 36. Um, I'm going to uh, defer discussion of uh, highlights from the summit until we have our general manager's report. Uh, the thing that was particularly motivating this time was that the House uh, uh, proposed budget at the time we went to visit there was to provide public television no money. Uh, there was also a bill pending um, to change the way that this money has been allocated in the past. That is, it's allocated two years into the future so that the stations and you know, CPB and PBS can do things like buy equipment with some stability uh, in their funding, uh, which was also uh, proposed to be cut uh, from two years to one year. Uh, so you couldn't do any planning beyond one year. I'm happy to report that Congress passed a budget bill last Saturday. Happy to report that. I'm also happy to report that it included um, all $535 million that the system was asking for. Uh, I'll leave the rest for uh, our station manager to address. Uh, Director Pence and I attended the Wisconsin Technical College District Boards Association spring meeting in beautiful Rhinelander, Wisconsin this past weekend. Uh, and again, I'm going to yield the floor to Director Pence to talk about what he saw and observed there. Well, I thought it was a very worthwhile thing to attend. Um, there was good presentations. It was cold. But <laughs> and snowy out, but there was good presentations. 
um, I, um, one of the, there was a good, uh, Nicolay has a good board trustee handbook that our, our fearless leader helped out with um, to draft. And I thought that was really something that we all should look at from time to time because I'm still in my apprenticeship on this board. Um, so I, I, I thought it was very well done. Um, the legislative part of it, there is a, you know, it, there's a place for this organization in what we do. There really is there. Uh, the legislative part of it is just another facet of legislation that we can look at. I think there should be a way to get more of that information to, to this board as well. Um, there were some good presentations on, on mental health and, and challenges of, of campus life there. They have different challenges with indigenous uh, um, communities up there. Um, there was a good there was a good uh, presentation on dual enrollment between um, Three Lakes High School and Nicolay College on their welding. Um, they have a welding class at, and I, I well, I'd like to get more information on that just so I know there's there's uh, high school kids can go to college. Correct me if I'm wrong. And go to the college and get credits towards their college while they're still in high school. So mm -hmm. um, maybe that's something that we need to look at with Milwaukee Tech. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was it was it was really it was I I enjoyed I enjoyed it. I thought it was a worthwhile trip, and I learned that Mark can play the piano. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Thank you. Uh, let me expand on uh, the manual, uh, the training manual a little bit. Uh, Diane Lazier, who's on the board at Nicolet Technical College, had been uh, working on revising their board member training program. Uh, and I spoke with her about this last October at a different board association meeting. And we uh, came up with the idea of developing a training program and a handbook uh, for new board members that could be generic enough uh, and then made specific to be used by all the colleges, but then made specific by each one to the extent they needed to be. For example, nobody else has a public television station to talk about. Uh, and there are various other things that are different. Uh, I had uh, tended to uh, uh, put an ad hoc committee to work at looking at that for us, but we're busy with the presidential uh, selection process. So we'll save that until we're at or near the end of that. Uh, but the uh, the I thought the most important things about this were that there was material for the new board members to review as we do uh, just before the September meetings, but that the rest of the material was designed in units of training that anticipated what was gonna happen at the board by about two months. So for example, we always have a mid-year review of the president in January. So two months before that, we would look at the evaluation instrument, we would talk about it, whatever else needed to be taught about that. We have a budgeting process that begins now. Two months before that, we would go into some depth um, on the budgeting process and it's uh, set up so that it, it uh, uses links to our website or links to the Wisconsin Technical College uh, system website or others for the materials that they actually prepare, saves us the time of doing it um, and could be easily updated. So that's a, a project I'm gonna come back to when we have a little more time as a board to, to address it. Um, uh, you've heard me say this before, I think it's a valuable organization. I think that it um, is uh, uh, revising its um, its procedures because of personnel changes and changing environments and everything else. But fundamentally, it performs this, this training function. They do training programs all the time uh, that are valuable to us. And they have a uh, state and federal uh, lobbyist who is the executive director of the association um, who speaks for all the tech colleges. And uh, I think Milwaukee... Uh, technical College decided a long time ago that there are things that we can effectively advocate for, and there are things which get a much better hearing 
in the state and federal legislatures when it's all 16 colleges, including everybody's districts, uh, asking together. So uh, you'll be hearing more about that. I encourage you all to attend the meetings. Uh, they meet quarterly. Uh, and uh, oh, I will certainly let you know about the next one, uh, which is about to be scheduled. There's also an annual planning meeting that occurs usually in you know, early September to talk about uh, what the goals will be on the legislative side. They're also there to respond. Uh, uh, last year, there was a sudden uh, attempt to uh, remove our ability to uh, raise funds for our operations from property taxes. Uh, and it came up uh, in secret overnight and was presented uh, for a vote or was going to be presented for a vote in the legislature on, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, it was less than 48 hours notice. And uh, the executive director of the District Boards Association was on vacation. And yet um, uh, she and others, uh, including director, or Dr. Martin, uh, organized a very strong response. Uh, uh, employers from every district in the state contacted their legislators and said, don't do this. Uh, and it didn't happen. So having the organization there and able to respond on a moment's notice to be at the center of efforts and coordinate is really important. Uh, next, uh, spring commencement, spring 2024, will be held during the weekend of May 17th to 19th at the Five Serve Forum. Uh, the date won't be set until we know the Bucks playoff posture, <laughs> uh, but watch for that. Uh, we had great turnout at the last commencement, and we'd like to do that again to get all of us there if we can, but certainly uh, a large number of us. Uh, next, presidential search updates. Uh, pardon me. Uh Round one interviews with the roughly dozen leading candidates will be conducted with our advisors, Greenwood Asher, on Wednesday, April 3rd and Thursday, April 4th via Zoom. The reference feedback meeting will be held on Thursday, April 18th from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, that meeting, we would prefer board members to be here in person, if at all possible, but there will be a Zoom link available. Uh, the board will be given a preliminary report and recommendations at that meeting for the uh, second round of interviewees. Round two of the interviews are tentatively scheduled to begin on campus on Friday, April 19, and continue through the week of April 22nd. Uh, some board members may be actively involved in campus interviews as well as collecting and compiling campus feedback. More of that to come. On Monday, April 29th, the board will meet in a special meeting from 5 to 7 p.m. to review campus feedback and make a presidential selection. We would prefer for board members to meet in person for that meeting again. However, a Zoom link will be available. And the intention is to uh, make an offer immediately after that meeting, provide some time to negotiate contract terms, and then to approve that contract at our May board meeting. Um, the new president will start on July 1st if all the rest of that comes into being as planned. Uh, Director Case, would you give us a foundation re liaison report, please? I would be happy to. The MATC Foundation Board met on February 29th for a strategic planning session whereby the board solidified the drafts of the vision and mission statements. The mission and vision statements were adopted at the um, at the foundation's board meeting on March 14th. METC Foundation's vision is a prosperous region built on expansive access to education and economic opportunities. As the college's philanthropic partner, METC Foundation's mission is to build donor relationships to facilitate private investments that remove barriers to education accelerate careers and deliver skilled talent to the Milwaukee area. The foundation also serves as the financial steward of private, private donations to Milwaukee PBS, a viewer supported service of MATC. As of March 25th, the foundation has received $6,042,428 in pledges and gifts year to date. This is 121% to the foundation's goal. 
to raise funds for the MATC Promise Scholarship and to raise awareness of the MATC Foundation as MATC's philanthropic partner, the foundation hosted a Blue Tender fundraising event in blue at the Pfister Hotel last night, March 25th. It was very well attended. That concludes my update. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Martin. Okay. Um, well, good evening, board members, um, staff, evening. faculty, students, and community. Um, on March 14th, we had uh, an event here called uh, Explore Your Future that included uh, 2,000 10th grade students from NPS um, across our campuses and it's part of the M Cubed initiative that we had started. Uh, and during this time, instructors demonstrated their programs and classrooms and labs so that students could understand what it is we offer here and help them with their career goals. Thanks to our Career Hub recruitment and high school relations team for that. Um, MATC Day, which is a non-student contact day, uh, it's a day of reflection, celebration, giving back to our community, it was held on Wednesday, March 13th. The day included a keynote address by Dr. Rob Johnstone of the National Center for Inquiry and Improvement titled Optimizing the Student Experience Through an Equitable Guided Pathways Framework. Grounding the work in post-graduation success. That's a mouthful, uh, but it was really uh, a powerful affirmation of the value of guided pathways in terms of the outcomes that we're seeing, the processes, especially around our design teams that um, he considers a national model. Uh, he also shared national research on where we are nationally around the guided pathways um, initiatives. Uh, there's a second book being written. Um, and I'm not sure the name of it exactly, but it's coming out soon. Um, and they're looking at all the data and the success of, of the model across the country. Um, so we did get um, some idea about what is next in terms of what we should be thinking about on our journey as well. Um, I think now they're also really focused in on a metric that we are also focused in on, which is around uh, social mobility and economic mobility for our students. So we, we talked a lot about how they come in and what happens with when they're there. Now we want to make sure that the next step is is uh, well grounded in the work that we're doing as well. And not that it isn't, but we want to make sure we strengthen that too. Um, we're going to incorporate these findings that we heard and that we are finding as well. You're going to hear more about that later, uh, but it'll be in our goals uh, for this next year uh, when I present the president's goals. Uh, we also had a bunch of uh, employee appreciation activities at all the campuses with our colleagues as well as coffee in the morning. Uh, we did have an all managers meeting on March 18th. We had a special guest, uh, Todd McLeese. He's a thought leader in generative artificial intelligence and its influence on work and learning. Um, he's been really, uh, Todd has been helping us internally as a consultant with our um, AI um, teams uh, that are part of our task force are looking at different projects across our, across our whole district about what we can do to really advance uh, our technology and our use of AI. Um, we're working also to embed this in our future goals uh, that you'll be seeing as well. We'll have a presentation on this probably in the next month or so, so that you can hear more details about it. Uh, we're an early voting site, I think as many of you know, uh, with the city of Milwaukee, we're better serving our students and our uh, citizens to make sure that um, they can vote early. We are, um, on that we're going to be at that site, obviously, from March 19th to the 28th, from noon to 6. I think you probably have seen the signs around our building. If you come down 6th Street, you can see them. It's in our Herbis Transportation Center in the lobby area of our T building, first floor. Um, there's a little area right there, and because I'm like, Where's, where are people parking to get in here? So there is a place for them to park as well on 6th Street. And then um, finally, uh, Black Excellence Award winners uh, that were sponsored by the Greater Milwaukee Urban League. Our own Amanda Brooks, uh, coordinator of student life at the Milwaukee downtown campus, and Aisha Barka, which I think you're going to hear from her later tonight, Director of Public Safety, were selected as Black Excellence Award honorees. Um, and this award honors 30 extraordinary African Americans in our city in the areas of education, arts, culture, religion, and business. Uh, Ms. Barkow was elect selected in the category of law. Uh, Ms. Brooks was selected in the category of aspiring game changer. Um, these uh, awards began in 1985, and this year honored 30 African Americans who exemplify the best qualities of leadership in our community. And that concludes my report. Yes. Director Baker. So I just want to underscore that thing about us being a voting site, because I understand that they're sort of testing it like 
we're not always a voting site. So I'm going to come here tomorrow and early vote. And I encourage everybody in the room to early vote here and tell your friends, because if we have a really good turnout here, then they will continue to use us as a site, which just makes voting that much easier for our students. Really? So I'll see all of you at the polls tomorrow. Second to that point, I did um, get a walk around the, the building or the, the campus with um, Dr. Dr. Philip King. Could you be a little left? Oh, sorry. I did get a walk around of, because I sent the email. Sorry, should I just say that. I sent the email to Dr. Martin about signage here on campus to make people aware of the early vote site. Because at the time, I think it was like maybe two or three days in, the turnout was extremely low. It still is kind of low today. I went and voted myself, and it was only 80 people for this entire time that it's been open. But he did walk me around. Um, show me some of the, of the additional signage and the emails and stuff that they have put out, um, as well as some um, plans for the upcoming elections, if we are still given a site. Any other questions or comments in the room on the President's Board Director Burris? I think we're supposed to say happy birthday to Dr. Martin now. And Chair Foley. And Chair Foley, yes. Two big birthdays. Same age, days apart, <laughs> 24 hours apart. Awesome. So your birthday was yesterday or tomorrow? Yesterday. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay, we'll sing after the meeting. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. They only have one cake. <laughs> and we can divide. We'll write a name in your subway. <laughs> um, next is the Legislative Matters Report. Ramey Zonkova, I think you are online. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair Foley, and good evening, members um, of the committee. Uh, my report will be brief this evening, um, and then I'm happy to take any um, questions. Um, you should have my written report in front of you um, this evening. I do not have any um, additional updates specific to legislation. Um, the legislation we've been tracking over the last few months, um, if it had not moved through the process that is essentially um, dead for the remainder of the year and will need to be reintroduced next year to move. Um, I do have um, something positive report to report, though, um, specific to Senate Bill 169, um, which is a bill that would create an, uh, an employer hotline um, to assist with individuals um, who have experienced um, incarceration to get back into the workforce. Um, this was part of a package of bills um, that came out of a study committee that um, Dr. Sadiq Isahaku um, served on very graciously on behalf of the college. It was his second time around actually on a committee like this. Um, the bill is gonna be signed by the governor um, later this week. So something positive um, to report there, um, specific to um, some of the legislative items that we have been engaged on over the last um, few months. Um, there are two items also that I've mentioned in prior reports, Assembly Bill 545 and Assembly Bill 1065. One relates to district board membership and the other relates to um, DEI statements and loyalty pledges. Um, both of those items have been en enrolled and um, pending uh, the governor's action. Um, you know, I think the expectation is the governor will seriously take a look at both and consider um, vetoing um, the proposal. So just two brief updates on, on those um, specific items. Um, otherwise, session is, for all intents and purposes, adjourned at this point. All eyes and energy really focused on the 2024 election, um, as I previously shared. Um, and knowing that we have new boundaries um, and a number of retirements and individuals who are either seeking higher office or other offices or are paired incumbents, um, we do expect to see, of course, a lot of new um, faces in the legislature and a different um, majority minority makeup as well in both chambers. Um, as, uh, as the chair indicated, um, we do finally have a budget that's been complete, which was done over the weekend um, for fiscal year 2024. And the president has just introduced um, his proposed budget for fiscal year 2025. Um, so that's hot off the press there. And then I also want to just um, share an update. This is an item that we've discussed at um, a prior legislative um, matters uh, committee meeting specific to the Arizona College of Nursing and some of the local activity um, on that item as it relates to the common council process there. Um, the higher education 
Regional Alliance, which is chaired by Dr. Martin, um, you know, organized some communication in opposition um, to Arizona College from um, coming into Milwaukee. It is a for-profit um, nursing school. Um, last week, the um, zoning committee did put on hold um, an item to address a zoning issue specific to the location that the college is seeking to move into. So as of right now, that matter is on hold. Um, that could come up um, at a later date before the committee. Um, there's a discussion regarding whether a zoning change is needed or not. Um, and of course, then um, part of that is a discussion that has now um, come before the committee specific to um, for-profit colleges and, and some of the history that um, we've seen in prior years in the city of Milwaukee. Um, so I wanted to share that um, debate as well. And with that, I will um, end my report and see if there are any questions. Dr. Morrow, can you repeat those AB numbers again? AB 545 and 1065. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then Senate Bill 169 is the one that the governor um, will sign um, later this week. And maybe tomorrow. There have been a number of them. So keeping track of them all has been quite a lot of work. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if all the if all board members have seen it, maybe we could even send it out. But there was a letter that came out from the Higher Education Regional Alliance, which Dr. Martin chairs, and about the Arizona College of Nursing. It was a very strong letter um, over her signature. And so I just really wanted to commend us for being part of that. And uh, it was to the Common Council, and it re represented all the colleges and universities with um, nursing programs here and the reality of what this sort of stuff means. Mm -hmm. um, very much student-centered. It was very good. I would like it. Yeah, yeah so may, I don't know. Do we have that? Can we send that out to the board? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments in the room? I still want to sing happy birthday. How about directors <laughs> online? Uh, any questions or comments? None. Seeing none, yeah. Randy, thank you very much. Party. Yeah. Next is the enrollment report. Uh, Ava Paulus Martinez. Uh, good evening, Chair Foley, Dr. Martin, members of the board, and our student from student government. Um, I am here today to talk about the enrollment report, and I will be highlighting some of the FTEs and headcounts uh, per our usual monthly presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, please note that as I, I am highlighting some of the enrollment trends, I will also give you updated information as of today, March uh, 26. So as of today, we have actually obtained 3,817 FTEs uh, for spring 2024. This is 100.9% over budgeted spring enrollment goal of 3,784. What does this mean? Yes. It is the, the year to date attained do we have a different number? Yes, uh, yes, um, yes. I I was going to get to that, and I do see that there's a three instead of an eight. Okay, that's okay. That, is that what you mean? Yes. yes. Thank you. Yes. So that should be eight. Yes. Or so eight if we look at the uh, at, at the screen, um, and the year to date, oh. uh, a tangle should be an eight instead of a three. So it's a um, eight thousand four hundred and eighty nine instead of three. So. Yes, thank you so much for pointing that out, Vice Chair uh, Baker. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, it means that as of today, we have actually, uh, we are actually 33 FTEs ahead for spring 2024. Uh, this is good news uh, for the college and our community, and it should be celebrated. In fact, this is the first time uh, in the last several years that MATC meets its spring 2024 goal. So it should be, it sh it's, it's a great highlight, good news, and our teams are very excited to be able to contribute towards this work. Uh, for example, last year around this time, last year, spring 2023, we actually had 3,624 FTEs. And then today we have 3,817. For a year-to-day goal, and that's where you see the, the three, and it should be an eight, uh, we actually have 
8,499 as of today. Our goal is 8,500. So we are one FTE away from what meeting. the board members? I know. So this is actually, we are one FTE away. If we get several of you to take the combined 30 credits, that makes up one FTE. So please, <laughs> or any of us here. <laughs> so that is, uh, that is really, really great news for the college that uh, we are seeing this enrollment trends um, uh, increase and we are meeting our goals. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, as you can tell, we are very confident that we are going to be meeting our 8,500 FT goal for this year. Um, and uh, we will continue and there's still registrations coming up so we can expect that number to continue to increase. Uh, our projected um, FTE should be probably around 8520. Um, okay. I think we're gonna end up the year with 8520, crossing our fingers, but we're very, very confident that we're moving forward. Um, we also do need to consider that we still need to work on retention. Uh, we cannot let our guard down. We have to make sure that our students continue with their classes to make sure that we continue in the upper, upper trend in enrollment. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is our usual funnel um, of FTEs biweekly. So every Monday morning we get this FTE report. And again, we are at 30, 3817 FTEs as of today. Um, so when you're looking at a comparison between last spring to today, we are about 193 FTEs difference. So that's around 200 FTEs uh, more this spring semester when compared to last uh, spring. That is a 5% increase in FTEs uh, for spring 2024. Next slide, please. And we are looking at our headcount and gives you uh, the number of of students, all students taking courses at MATC and this funnel um, is pretty critical because we know that headcounts contribute to FTE. So it's important to keep track of both FTEs and headcounts. Um, so as of today, uh, we are at 18,098 FTE, uh, I'm sorry, headcounts. Uh, so when we compare our headcounts from last spring semester to this spring semester, we are about 400 headcounts um, more for this spring semester, which is fantastic. Um, it is important to recognize this, this milestone and continue to work on our enrollment and continue to, to highlight the important work that our teams are doing behind the scenes to get us to this number. Uh, we are still lagging a little uh, behind um, when we compare ourselves from spring 2024 and spring 2020, but I am pretty sure we're gonna get there in the next couple of years. And, and I'm crossing my fingers and working effectively with our teams. Uh, next slide, please. This slide is the student um, demographics. Um, uh, things haven't changed much uh, from the last time that I presented to you in February. Uh, we still have very similar demographics by gender, uh, race, and ethnicity. Um, you know, noteworthy is that our white, black, and Hispanic students make up the majority of the MAPC student body. Um, so if, if you consider these three groups, uh, they make up 83% of our student body at MATC. It's important to continue to support those populations and all populations to keep up with our enrollment trend. Um, as we continue to, to work with different populations, we have different strategies in place and we are meeting uh, on a weekly basis to make sure that we are implementing just-in-time strategies. Um, I also wanted to mention, since it was brought up at the last board meeting, that we continue to work on our application improvements. Uh, for example, uh, we have a team uh, looking at um, adding non-binary as an option um, on the application. We know that when our students are applying to MATC, they have to see themselves represented. We cannot have um, members of our LGBTQ plus community completing an application and they do, we do not have options that are inclusive and welcoming. I had a conversation with our team about making sure that we include non-binary um, in addition to male and female uh, gender as well. We, we are also looking into the racial ethnic populations as well. So we are hoping to get something in place in maybe two or three months. Um, it's taking a little longer, but that we have to work with the technology that we have. Next slide, please. Our HSI number has not changed, it's still 19.2. Uh, but I, I did wanted to highlight that uh, on Thursday, we are going to be hosting our Casa Abierta open house at Walker Square. So we are also working very closely with our HI team to make sure that we have that support 
and holistic support for Hispanic students because they also um, they have unique experiences and we have to be able to support their holistic development and success. Next slide, please. The chart that you see in front of you is from the WTCS um, enrollment, um, enrollment uh, by gender and race and ethnicity. Um, this is actually very interesting. I, you know, I, I, I love data. And when I was looking at the WTCS, um, I immediately noticed we, we have been noticing that uh, we have seen some uh, declines in, in the total population of students within enrolling within the WTCS um, within the last 10 years. But we have also seen uh, some uh, enrollment inclines and some uh, enrollment growth uh, within certain populations. So for example, as we become a Hispanic serving institution, it's important to see that our Hispanic students are, um, within WTCS um, are the one of one of the few populations that are growing. They continue to grow and uh, they continue to enroll within WTCS and also MATC. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to showcase uh, this slide in particular from um, a year ago. And uh, so when we look at MATC and other WTCS um, schools, we know that MATC enrolls the highest, uh, the highest volume of Asian, Black, African American, and Hispanic students. This is something special for MATC as one of the most diverse colleges in the region, and it needs to be highlighted and continue to be highlighted as an asset. For example, if you look at the Hispanic student population, MATC enrolls the highest volume of Hispanic students within WTCS. That is such a huge accomplishment for MATC, and we're very proud to serve that population. Although we are not at 25% yet, um, I do believe that it's a matter of time if we continue with these trends. Hispanic students will continue to seek an MATC uh, education, which is also in line with national trends and also research that points that Hispanic students tend to enroll in community technical colleges more than any other college. Next slide, please. This slide uh, shows a little bit about serving black and brown students and all students at MATC. I wanted to highlight a couple of wins and a couple of opportunities. So for example, in looking at the WTCS uh, numbers, we know that MATC enrolls a very diverse student population. And that is something that we need to be proud of. Uh, we also know that MATC graduates the highest number of Asian, black and Hispanic students within WTCS. Another win for MATC. I do see additional opportunities. For example, when it comes to enrollment and retention, we need to continue to work on eliminating gaps and also really focusing on racial, the racial equity gap. Because as you begin to desegregate enrollment and retention data, we can clearly see that there are some gaps, especially with our Black African-American students. I believe the implementation of guided path pathways uh, has been um, a really great uh, initiative for MATC as we continue to become student ready and making sure that all of our students are succeeding here. Next slide, please. This is my last slide and just giving you a quick snapshot of enrollment by pathway. And uh, uh, we continue to see uh, trends in the highlighted areas and we continue to, um, to, to make sure that we are providing additional supports for students that need it. Um, I also wanted to say that we have uh, registration events coming up the second and third week of April to make sure that we encourage new and continuing students to register for fall semester. And then we also continue to monitor all aspects of the enrollment funnel to make sure that we continue with our enrollment trends. We also held an enrollment retreat last Friday with cross-functional teams from academics and student services. And we are on our way to ensure that we are uh, developing a more collaborative uh, perspective when it comes to enrollment and retention. Lastly, the numbers uh, speak for themselves. Uh, we are doing solid, we're good, and uh, it should only get better from here on. Uh, the deans, I wanted to say that the deans in particular are very in tune with the enrollment key drivers uh, when it comes to making sure that students are not falling through the cracks within the pathways. Uh, thank you so much. This concludes my update and report. Thank you, Director Mindy. Thank you. So I'm looking at the numbers and see how the Hispanic enrollment has been increasing with their students. 
how exactly do you calculate our percentage for HSI? Because it doesn't seem to, our numbers keep increasing and our number is still at the 19%. So it doesn't make yes. sense that we're not moving the needle up. Can you explain me how is that yeah. calculated? So, um, so we, so because the, the total number of MATC students is increasing, so is the Hispanic student population. And how often is that number calculated? Uh, the HSI is mm -hmm. once per year in October, once September and October. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so for example, if we were to stay at the same number of students, let's say um, uh, 10,000 students, for example, and our enrollment number was growing and growing, then we would see that percentage come up. But because they're both growing at the same time, our total student population is growing at the same rate as our Hispanic student population, uh, they're both uh, growing. Yeah. Did, 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 no, I'm just saying because I'm Go ahead. Um, so I, I had a slightly different on the enrollment data by uh, gender, race, and ethnicity comparing us to other colleges. Um, and not obviously this is the data we have, but it would um, be really useful to see this data in percentages. It's always hard for me to make comparisons with raw numbers with MATC because we are larger than anybody else. Yes. And so I'd like, you know what I mean? Are we also, are we achieving at the rate we should be achieving in two ways, one, given who our communities are versus the communities that Chippewa Valley serves um, and in terms of our overall student body. Yeah, so I think that would be useful for us as board as a board in terms of looking at our targets and how we're reaching them. Thanks, sounds good, thank you. Um, questions in the room? Uh, Dr. Najib? Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any progress or update on adding the Middle Eastern or Arab uh, ethnicity to the MATC's demographics? Uh, yes, we we are working on that, um, in, including the adding uh, the different um, race and ethnicities. So we're looking at different subgroups under those big groups and those big umbrellas. Um, it's a little bit challenging, but we are working through it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions by board members online? You got a question. We have Something. a question here in the room. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Next thank you. is the Milwaukee PBS General Manager's report. Ain't quite put to hear the words, but Hello. Right. That's what I mean. Welcome. Thank you. Hi again. Hi again. <laughs> Sorry, I laughed at you, but it was it was one of those days. She was trying to get in the library to get in one side. It wasn't even a library. I was in the wrong <laughs> side. <laughs> it happens. I was on the second floor, third floor, same spot. It made me feel place. better about my day. <laughs> so thank Let's you. Start to your report. Yes, thank you for that. So. Uh, as Chair Foley did mention, we went to Washington, D.C. with two other lay leaders, Julie Biller and Amy Daniels, who I'd really uh, like to thank again for taking time to go to Washington with us. Um, to break down that $535 million big number, uh, which we're thrilled that went through, uh, 60 million of it was for the interconnection system that interconnects all of the public media stations together so we can uh, transfer files more easily. 31 million was for ready to learn. And uh, I find this uh, statistic to be um, concerning in a way. And also I take maybe some pride in the fact that PBS plays such a big role for <clears throat> preschool education um, for more than half of children uh, in the country rely on PBS uh, children's programs which is astounding to me um and it is uh it, i do take great pride in the in the programs that we that we serve community with and that's one that uh that was 31 million dollars well spent uh 40 million dollars for next generation warning system that we work with fema on and so that breaks it down a little bit um just so you can understand what our number is, it's around $2 million that we receive for our federal grant every year. Uh, again, it's two years forward funded. 
And um, attached to my re report um, that I'll send afterwards, you'll find a uh, Pat Butler as the executive director for APTS, the American Public Television Stations group. He's been there for 13 years. He's done an amazing job. He took over that position at a time when it was, uh, it was very challenging. Um, we say that it's challenging now. It was even more challenging then. And his uh, speech was very inspirational, and I would uh, encourage you to read that. Uh, Senator Baldwin received the 2024 Champion of Public Broadcasting Award for her work uh, across the aisle to bring people together around those, those bills. And um, on a slightly different note, we have uh, several retirements coming up. In addition to 13 open positions, we continue to work with HR to post these positions and hire as quickly as possible. Milwaukee PBS has enjoyed a long tenured staff and these retirements will be difficult as much of the station's history resides with these people, even though we have documented a lot of the history and we have processes and procedures documented also. It still is, uh, you can't replace someone who's been there for 35 or 40 years and can tell you why 20 years ago we did X, Y, and Z. <laughs> you know, some things just kind of, you can't document, but um, we will work through those open positions and, and fill them as quickly as we can. Uh, last week, I attended the major market meeting. Uh, it's the top 40 stations from across the country come together to explore pressing issues within the system. Um, just so you know, we are number 37. Um, there's no shortage of things to talk about with the changing media environment for sure. Um, however, the most pressing need is to talk about how to improve our fundraising efforts and uh, test out new initiatives. So the group decided to form three committees to investigate annual giving, major giving and sponsorships, test out new ways to do those things um, get into some different areas that we may not have even thought about. And then we will work with PBS in how to roll those things out. Um, I'm excited to announce and confirm that Judy Woodruff and the NewsHour uh, production team are gonna be in Milwaukee mid-September to conduct a, a small town hall of about 50 people, um, tentatively entitled an American Town Hall in which they'll have a conversation with attendees about the issues at the source of our greatest divide, the values that bind us together, regardless of party and politics and ideas for restoring a measure of civility to the public square. The program will air the following week, uh, September 23rd on all stations across the country. Um, in addition, the news hour has put on hold our studio for the week of the RNC in case they need it for any production. They haven't identified anything in particular, but it is a paid hold, so we will be happy to do that. Um, our first project leading into the election is entitled Vote 2024 Table Talk. In partnership with Marquette University, recorded last week the first uh, table talk we did. And we will use snippets from uh, a series of three of these events within our local programs uh, starting in May, and the topics include climate, democracy, immigration, and education. Uh, we'll be working with the American Archive of Public Broadcasting, a collaboration between GBH, a station in, in Boston, and the Library of Congress to preserve, digitize, and archive our collection. They were awarded a large Mellon Foundation grant, and we have an impressive archive, including 32 seasons of Black Nouveau, 25 seasons of Adelante, along with uh, years and years of historical documentaries, um, more interviews that you can count, um, and so many more, uh, you know, treasures and history from the southeastern Wisconsin and, and Milwaukee area. This will cost us nothing. It is a grant, and we are happy to be preserving this material for the public to view. Um, on the revenue front, we're at 80% of our $6.7 million goal. That's approximately about 5.3 million, uh, which I'm happy to share. Uh, so we're close, very close, and we're I'm very uh, confident that we will make our goal this year. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions in the room? I just wanted to clarify, you said that MATC will receive 2 million. Is that one million for each year, but we'll receive it all at one time. It's two million for each year. Okay, so a total of four. Yeah. Okay. For, 
yeah, it's two years forward funded. So, okay. Yeah. Any other questions in the room? Uh, any questions from the directors online? Right. Seeing none, I do have a quick question. When you say that we are 37 out of the 40, was it largest? Yes, the top markets. Okay, so it's yeah. size of market. It's size of market. Okay. Size right. of people we reach, size of population. Who's number uh, 36 and how much bigger are they? <laughs> um, we're pretty close. I think we're close to Nashville. I want to say that's the next one. Thank you for your yeah. report. Thank you. Next is... <clears throat> the District Student Senate Report. Kimberly Haynes. Thank you, Director Foley. Thank you, Dr. Vicki Martin, members of MATC District Board and Administration. The District Student Government Association met on March 22nd, 2024. We approved two new student organizations at MATC, the Baking Club Organization, which is open to everyone. They're hoping to go on trips and they want to make an MATC books cookbook to sell. The second organization is the Nursing Students Without Borders organization, which is also open to more than healthcare students, service community base, also hoping for trips, participate in fundraising for themselves and the community. We are pre-funding to the Rohegan Student Association funding request for their trip, which is planned from May 27th to the 30th. We approve funding for the Mothership Organization. We're funding to attend the Midwest Gaming Conference at the Baird Center. We approve funding for the Future Hospitality Managers Organization to go to the National Restaurant Trade Show in Chicago, May 18th to the 21st. We also approve the Black Student Union funding request to assist with hosting their adult prom event May 4th from 7 to 10 p.m. Proposed amendments to the Constitution were reviewed. Voting on the changes will be April 7th to the 12th. Changes focused on increasing the number of students involved and increasing the student voice throughout campus. Director of Student Life presented the annual budget look ahead for 24-25, 2024-2025. He went over monetary allocation for the student activity fee, and it was approved by DSGA. DSGA's next meeting will be held on 4-19-2024. Student government downtown had a meeting. They're hoping to support a resource center with Hygiene Drive. Student Life has a new space open to students. South has had Women's History Month events this month, and they're finishing uh, free filing of taxes. West SGA did a rock painting event as a unique opportunity to recruit more students to our SGA. Mequon had Community Day, International Coffee Hour, Adopter Roadway, and Yoga and Meditation. The next student Wisconsin Student Government meeting is April 5th, 2024. Both student leaders were extremely fortunate, me included, with two advisors by getting to go to a Washington DC trip, March 15th through the 19th, 2024. We got to attend the yearly ASAC, the American Student Association of Community College meeting, as well as the American Black History Museum and the Air and Space Museum. The whole trip was extremely profound. Speaking for myself, I learned an abundance of information that I will continue to use the rest of my life. It was extremely motivating, encouraging, and interactive. We learned about performative advocacy and how we have the power to create change. We learned that changes take advocacy and activism to receive results. The system of depression is like an escalator going down. If we, for example, put a post on TikTok, yet we do nothing else to support that thought, we are standing on the escalator in neutral. How Ali Ship is the escalator going up. Doing something consistently, you're standing up for something. How there must be collaboration, consistency, and action are two things that must continue to do. 
We had an option of five groups to choose from twice. I attended a Don't Be Afraid to Light at Spark and successfully working with college administration, one unique model. I learned quite a bit of information in the little time that we were allowed. One thing from each group that I learned was the following. The elements of student advocacy are passion, community, and sustainability. The other thing that I learned was you the professional thing and include them in your meetings. And even if they don't attend it, send them a copy of the minutes. Don't misstate information. We visited the offices of Senators Tammy Baldwin and Ron Johnson, asking for their support with the Dream Act of 2023, the Pell Grant funding, and the Higher Education Reauthorization Act HIA. Overall, I learned that advocacy is about consistency and resilience. As a result, I look forward to continuing this work and engaging my peers around advocacy. Student Life has done an awesome job in offering information such as flyers explaining International Women's Day, podcasts supporting women, and a flyer detailing Women's History Month braces and stickers in support of celebrating Women's History Month. They've also had Community Days, a blood drive, Working Mothers event, Neurodivergent, group meeting and painting. Finally, I thank you all for your time and the opportunity to share this information with you today and keep you updated. Thank you for your report. I just want to say thank you. It seemed like you've been up to a lot. I see you had to take your breath a couple times. So the thank you. The Washington trip was just amazing. Huh? amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Baker. Chipotle, before, and thank you for your report. I enjoyed that. Um, before we move away from reports, would it be, is it okay if I asked a question of an earlier report? Sure. Just something clarifying. Is it like took a minute for it to like actually sit around in my brain and try and make sense? But in the um, enrollment report where we were talking about HSI, I think we were told that that number is only figured once a year, like in October or November. Do we get to update that number as our numbers change? We do. I, I, I apologize. Um, um, yes, we do. So that 19.2 is measured yes. once a year. That's um, measured once a year. Yes, once a year. Um, so um, we were at 19.5 uh, last year. And then when we measured again, it came down a little bit by 0.3. So we're at 19.2. But like if we enroll more students in the spring, do we get to look at that number again in the spring or we have to wait till the fall we have to wait until the fall we so can, we could yeah. be there right now but we won't know it until the fall yep uh -huh. yes yes okay mm -hmm. there you Thank go you. Sigla. but but right. if, if you look if you we, look at where i was going yes if you look at the head counts and the fdes mm -hmm. and you disaggregate it by race and hispanic students that's a leading indicator so the leading indicator for us that we're making progress is when the headcounts are going up sure. and the FTEs are going up, okay. even though we're only able to measure it once a year. Okay. And, uh, you know, other institutions, so for example, four-year institutions are able to measure that more effectively because they have like cohorts beginning every, like every, every year, like in the fall. So their processes are much easier. So for example, when I worked at Marquette, we could see it. We could see it at the early uh, fall semester and then we could see it again in spring. But but we're not Marquettes, you know, we're MATC, so we're, we're able to measure it in a different way here. And we can request that. So let's say that for some odd reason, we have an additional 500 students enrolling this semester. We can't reach out to them and request and say like, hey, we believe this helped us get there. We have to wait until October. They're like pointed. Yeah, oh, well, that's a uh, here today. Wednesday. I'm so sorry I didn't see you. That's a win. Coming over, yes. Beautiful answer for that. Because uh, what we talk about HSI <laughs> is a. Oh, sorry. This is Yan Wang, Director for Institute <laughs> Research. Uh, I think when we talk about HSI, we're talking about the federal government definition, and they use APAS data, which is the integrated post secondary data system that they only report once a year. Okay. So it's not like we can keep track of anything we want internally, but then if we talk about the federal. Um, Guideline. That's why we only have that one number once a year. Mm -hmm. Once we close the IPAS data Thank you. for the fall Thank term. You. And I apologize for taking everybody down a rabbit hole, but it just no, was sort of hanging out there. Clarify. Make sense. Yeah. So that's fine. Now I have a, a clarifying question to make sure I'm understanding it correct. So we were at the nineteen point two percent starting off. We don't know if we're above that now. 
we or, won't know until next fall. <laughs> right. So internally, we don't know if we're above that, but we could potentially, like she said, be above the 19.2%? We can calculate it, but then again, it's not following the federal definition. So we can talk saying we are getting better, but still until next fall, we won't know whether it's getting better compared to last fall. They always take the fall number, not the spring number, not the total year. They just use the fall term enrollment. And it's only among undergraduate students. That's another difference I want to emphasize. I know uh, she knows this, um, is like we have so many, we call non post-secondary students, community mm -hmm. education students, that is not counted towards the federal right. definition either. Right. So they yeah. only count yeah. undergraduate students. Yeah. So that's another big difference. When we show numbers, it may include community education looks, because we do have a higher percentage Hispanic among community education. Gotcha. That's why it does look higher when we look at everything. But if you look at just poke center only, that could be lower as well. Mm -hmm. okay. So if, if, we, if we see any dips in our head counts for Hispanic students or FTEs, then we know it's a leading indicator that is going down. Mm -hmm. So we have to be, very intentional about making sure head counts for Hispanic students and FTEs are moving forward and going up instead of going back. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Wang. Sure. <laughs> Next is Guided Pathways Assessment, uh, Dr. Mannion. You may ask Dr. Wang to come back. <laughs> um, but I also wanted um, Dr. King to come here. We didn't know what you guys wanted to talk about. I kind of cover the past, present, He's doing the future combination. So tag team a little bit. Um, and before we get started in the conversation, I think you have the handout at your Yes. Okay. So um, one thing, well, first, hello. <laughs> I start talking from over there. I apologize for that. I'm just so excited to talk about this. So um, thanks for watching the long video. Um, do appreciate that. Um, but before we start our actual conversation, um, Director Foley had mentioned that and kind of in my excitement to give you some of those numbers, um, some of our results, I may not have given you the context of those results. And so that's where I wanted to start today. Um, so we know that Guided Pathways is all about our processes and improving the student experience so that ultimately we improve our student completion. So when we have our um, ultimate goal of completion, we have kind of what these guys were just talking about, those leading indicators, which are the retention and the persistence. So those are why we highlighted those in the presentation. But what I forgot to do was put it in the context of our five-year goal, which we set in the beginning of the Guided Pathways journey. So if we look at, I think it's, it's the blue slides, maybe page seven. Is that copy of that one? So yeah, the top one with big thirteen percent. Yeah, that would be it. The one with the big thirteen <laughs> percent. <laughs> yes. So, um, so with that one, so what I want to just point out was when we're talking about persistence, which is the the bright blue on the left, we're talking about the students who were here in December and they came back in the spring, and we can check that every year. So that's why it's a leading indicator. And the one in the dark one, the retention, that's a fall to fall. So we have to wait. So for example, um, in 2018, for our persistence, we said that by 2025, we want to get to 80%. So that was our ultimate goal. And so this past, um, for the persistence, we've gone up, we thought we had gone up 5% to 68. But um, Dr. Wang just recently gave us, and it's on your dashboard in front of you, that this year's fall to spring went up to 71%. So we're now actually at 8% increase. So with 71%, our five-year goal was 80%. So we're feeling pretty good about that. So that was, you know, we set that goal in 2018. So that's the persistence. For retention, again, that fall to fall, so we can't touch that one again until next fall. Um, so our retention numbers there, um, that's where we went up to 13%. Um, and our original goal for 2025 um, was 53% and we are at 54%. So we've already reached that goal, which means we're gonna reset it um, a year early. So, and then, uh, so I'll stop there for questions about persistence or retention before we go to the context of the completion goal. All right, and so then the completion, which is the big, 6% arrow going up. So our completion goal 
we originally had set for 2025, our five-year goal was 25%, and we are now at 24%. So again, very confident we will reach that. And we're, we didn't have this included, but this 6% also in the 24%, it represents a 3% decrease in our equity gap. And so we went from 10% down to 7%. And of course, our ultimate goal is zero. Um, so again, showing that we're trending in the right direction. But I just kind of wanted to give some of that context for those. And, and that's why, yes, I did show those twice. In the in, you, you didn't fall asleep and wait, where did I go? I, I showed that twice in the presentation because it's the context of everything else. These are the big three. And then here are the other pieces to get there. And then the big three again. Um, so we do feel really good about these numbers are trending upward. Um, still a lot of work to do. Um, this is one of the things Dr. Johnston, um, I included that clip, um, the actual video of his presentation was included in the PDF version. If you have 90 minutes in your free time, you could watch it. But one of the things he reminded everyone and, and with the new book coming out is this work takes 10 to 12 years to really start seeing those numbers. They've pushed the, the timeline out and that it's really important that you know we were grounded in access originally community colleges we've been focusing on the completion agenda for the last you know 10 years or so but now this social mobility piece is a new lens making sure that they're completing but to what is it a family sustaining wage is it um, a salary that if needed could change and and generational cycles of poverty so with that in mind, um, it's just a different, it's a different conversation or an extra layer. It's kind of like the next step. So we're going to be adding, I think Dr. Martin mentioned it. So somebody mentioned it today, the idea of social mobility um, metrics to all of this as part of that overall student success, helping us better understand student success and what it means. So I will pause there because I just want to make sure. And is there anything else, uh, Director Foley? No, I think you covered it very well. Okay. Thank you. So, any other okay. questions? Uh, do you have anything else you want to present uh, or just respond to questions? Yeah, no, you guys have everything in front of you. Okay. Any questions in the room? Any questions from the directors online? No, thank you. Well, you get off easy time. <laughs> I know. Really? I'm leaving. Okay, but that doesn't mean you always give us yes. like 30 minute videos with 90 minutes of yeah. guide talking. <laughs> I'm just saying it was good stuff. Um, I actually watched about five minutes of him, but I do watch. I mean, he's like really interesting. You guys, I think in particular, would love that labor data. It was. I mean, it's data, and yet it was riveting. I mean, it was it was really, and it really did set the stage for the next iteration of Guided Pathways as we're moving forward and what it means for our students to succeed um, and kind of gives us, and, and this is why, you know, these guys are looking at this to say, what's our next steps for next year, annual goals, et cetera. So it, it's, it was really good stuff, but a bit long. About halfway in is probably where you start getting to the meat of what he's commenting on. He really got going used, using those data points connecting to high wage jobs, careers, and some of the stuff you see in the latter part of the report. That real connection, career connections, kept, keeps coming up repeated. So, if you have time. He's willing to go back. Yeah. At the, uh, the District Board Association meetings, there's a lot of conversation about this topic of what jobs are we really training people for? Uh, and of course, some of that is dictated by the state funding mechanism. Mm -hmm where they identify the jobs of greatest need and then give extra points for graduating people in those categories. But unfortunately, two of those categories are um, uh, food service workers and childcare, which are two of the lowest paid occupations. It's just that there are lots of, uh, there's lots of demand for numbers in those areas. We may have to start some thinking at the state level about changing how they set those goals and award funding points because it's really missing the point. All right, thank you thank very much. You. Uh, not next is the risk management and public safety update from Maisha Barco. Welcome. 
And congratulations. Thank well. you. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. So good evening, chairfully, um, President Dr. Martin, directors and all attendees, thank you. I'm Aisha Barco, Director of Public Safety, and today joining me, I'll let you introduce yourself. I'm Virginia Hart, the District Risk Environmental Health and Safety Manager. And I'm Sherry Rowe, the Coordinator of Clery Compliance and Emergency Management. Thank you. So they make up um, my, my team here in public safety. So they're joining me today for any questions. I did submit our slides, a recording of the slides ahead of time. And you also have um, the slides in your packet for today. Um, so I will just talk about one slide first, just to give some clarification within that packet. And then we will open it up for any questions. Um, if you look at the last um, page, the slide that have our crime stats. Mm -hmm. um, right there, thank you. Um, so this is a slide that I took directly out of our 2023 Annual Security and Fire Safety Report. This is the book that I just passed out. So as a reminder, this is the book we have to publish every year by October 1st. It, re it involves crime stats, um, education, safety um, education information for the full preceding three years. So as you notice, this is going to be the reports for numbers up to 20, um, 20 2021, and 2022. And these are the numbers, the um, stats that we have to submit to the Department of Education. Um, so I just wanted to point out, um, and this is what we call the Clery Act um, and, the, and the crimes that we have to report. As you can notice, all our numbers went down in these categories, except for vehicle thefts. Um, and it looks pretty high, as you can see. Oh. Um, and again, <laughs> yes. And these numbers is district-wide that you're seeing on the slide. In the book, it is broken down by campus. Um, oh, so you'll be able to see the different numbers. But when we're looking at district-wide, uh, what you see is we had um, an increase. We had 91 vehicle th um, thefts that's reported around our campus district-wide. Um, we actually only received a report of eight that we actually responded to. The remaining 83 is what was reported to us from Milwaukee Police Department. So those would be um, vehicle thefts that happened in our jurisdiction, didn't happen uh, in our garage. We, we give them the location and they give us the reports. We don't actually have the reports, but they give us the numbers that say this, how many vehicle um, thefts have happened in your area. We are very proactive in public safety. We do hand out vehicle safety locks, especially for a couple of the vehicles that are kind of the ones that they target a lot. Target a lot. We do do safety patrols. Um, we do that by foot and vehicle. We provide safety tips. Um, so we really are, we, and we do what we call crime awareness. So when we are aware of a vehicle that has been stolen, we do put that out to the campus. Um, and that is a requirement for our Clery Act. We do have to give out that notification. So we make sure that our campus community is very informed. Uh, we make sure that we're out there and that we're visible. Um, so any questions regarding these numbers? As I um, stated before, all our other numbers have went down um, when you're looking at it. Um, we will be publishing 2023 numbers, which by October. We are waiting for um, our crime stats to come back in from our local jurisdictions. You say it's different in, in the book. So in the book, you'll see um, this, these numbers are district-wide. So this includes all our campuses, so not just downtown, Mequon, West Dallas. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And in the book, they do have it broken down by campus, if you would like to see the numbers by campus. And then what I can have just for a quick minute, share if you just would like to give a Summary exactly what's in the book. Sherry had played a very integral role every year. Um, she's really involved with getting this book, working with different departments throughout the campus because it is a team effort. Um, and so if you just want to briefly explain what's in yeah. the book. So the annual security and fire safety report is a combination of policies and procedures regarding safety. Um, there's very specific requirements that is spelled out in the Clery Act that the Department of Education enforces. And it talks about anything from public safety's jurisdiction to Title IX requirements, the VAWA, Violence Against Women Act regulations. There are specific policies in there that we have to share 
um, with our college community, letting them know things like um, the safety and awareness and prevention campaigns that we do, the the training that we do, things like that. So that's this book it looks thick, but it's really just a kind of reiterating what our policies and procedures are. And it's mainly intended for new students, potential students to come to our college. We present this to them, we make it available to them so they can decide, is this a safe place for me to attend? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a promotional item to let college know or, or let the community know how safe our campus is, um, comparing our numbers to some of the other colleges around the area, Marquette, UWM, MSOE. Our numbers usually are um, smaller, less, less crimes occur on our campus comparatively. So um, we're, we're proud of that. Absolutely. So it is a consumer protection law. So this mm -hmm. is why we have to submit this um, this report. Yeah. Okay, so you told me there was a book, so now I'm looking at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I do, I noticed in the back, there's a very long um, oh, policy procedure. Um, or it's uh, actually administrative regulation and procedure. And it's interim. Is that something, do we need to approve this to make it ever, you know, it says it's an interim process. I think the reason that that is interim is because the Department of Ed is actually updating the Title IX regulations at the moment. And so we're still waiting. They told, I, I guess they told us that those regulations would be available last October. And then they extended it again and said, no, it won't be available until I think it's, we're expecting it to come up in the next couple of months. I just had this conversation with the Deputy Title IX Coordinator, and we are expecting to update that with the new regulations. Um, but in the meantime, it's an interim policy. Thank yeah. you. And the reason we include that that policy um, verbatim in, in the document is just because of the, the length of the Title IX policy and how in-depth it is. So rather than restating that for each procedure mm -hmm. that's required within the book, we we explain it and then we also include the policy. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Director Burris. Oh, I don't know what number slide this is. Uh, safety updates. That would be me. I think. Um, it says staffing, equipment upgrades. Yes. Okay. I so, think it's the one right before. Yeah. Yes. Um. So these things have already been implemented, or they're still like underway. So some have been implemented and they're underway. If we look at equipment upgrades, um, yeah. we're currently working on upgrading our video surveillance system. So what that means is we are adding more cameras throughout our district. We are working with local law enforcement. So in the case of an emergency, they can have quick access to our cameras. Mm -hmm. We're in the process, we're working with our information technology unit who's working with the local jurisdictions to get them access to that. Uh, we're also, what we do um, with our video surveillance system is what we do is a vulnerability assessment. So we are walking around the campus. Where are we vulnerable at? Where do we need more eyes? Where do we need um, cameras? So we're in the process of um, doing that. And that's actually a project that um, Virginia um, Hart is working on where we're identifying some of those vulnerability spots. And then our mass notification system, we're also in the process of upgrading our mass notification. So um, we have upgraded all of the regional campus and we're in the process of upgrading our system here at the downtown campus. And we work with the constructions department on that upgrade. Um, when we're looking at our safety program, what I did here is just listed all our um, programs that we have. Um, and one that I'm really proud of, and I may still, um, Dr. Bray's um, thunder here, is our active shooter <laughs> video. So we recently just, um, produced um, an active shooter video here on campus. And we use our students, we used our staff, mm -hmm. uh, we use faculty. We really made our active shooter video something that people can really look yeah. at and feel and engage in so that when they're looking at this video, what do we do if an active shooter would come on the campus? And so our video, it we use our building so it's familiar to them. Before we were using a generic video, and a lot of people still didn't know what to do. So we had produced a video. Um, and I'm just going to say Sherry, because she she wrote the script. She did a very great job. <laughs> and with that, we also just won an award. So we received the Gold Award for the mm -hmm. promotional video long um, form category, category. That's a two-year college national. Um, I just had to get, because it's a long one, um, 
National Council for Marketing and Public Relations. It's the Paragon Award, and we took gold. So you won. Yes. 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 I just said I made it to get done. And, and um, the video, we also partner with Milwaukee Police Department. So when you see the video, um, you'll see Milwaukee Police Department. And that was uh, compliance training. So everyone at our college um, was required to watch that so that they know if we have an actor shooter, what are your choices? What do we do? Because we have to empower um, everyone that's on campus, our campus community, to what to do. Because um, safety is a shared responsibility and it's a partnership. Right it was job. a team effort. It was a team <laughs> effort. Yeah. Where, Director Moore, I'm looking. Where is that video available for us to see? Yes. So, some total. And I think we do. <laughs> um, did we put it on the YouTube? It's page? on some total yes. for employees to view, but it's and also get available the on the yeah. MATC YouTube. Yeah, yeah I can um, ensure that people get a link. A link to it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's awesome. Oh, and the other thing, the yeah, the yeah. other thing that I will let you know that we did that I'm really proud of as well, we produced it in English and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a closed caption in Spanish; it's actual spoken in Spanish as well. So awesome. we're really proud of and that. And I had a student that worked actually on the production. Yeah, company. one of yeah. our our graduate students and a current student also worked awesome. on it. We yeah. partnered with a company called Source Ten, and they the That's videographer true. actually is a graduate of MATC. Yeah. And there was a, the assistant production manager as a current student at the time that we filmed. So we're really proud of that as well. Rock star, thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes. What was the name of the award that you won again? Oh, you want me to repeat this. So it is a <laughs> promotional video long form. Um, and that's the category. So promotional video long. Um, and we took gold. You said that there were students working on, on, on it with you? Yes, yes. On our on the so, actors of the video. Yeah, so yes. the the participants in the video that act there are, there are some paid actors, but the remainder were actual students that participated as actors in the in the video, as well as some employees. And then the production team that produced the video, shot the video, and produced put it all together. There were a graduate of MBTC who was the filmer, and then an assistant production manager was a current student at the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So when I say team effort, I really do mean <laughs> team effort. Yeah. What's uh What's the scope of your team across all the campuses? How many? I mean, so I have thirty five officers all together. We are twenty four seven, so we always have someone here. Um, mm -hmm. Third shift, all the regional campus start closed, so then we just have officers here with the downtown, and then I have um, four command staff. Um, and then I have Virginia, our risk manager, Sherry, our emergency management, and then some um, dispatchers. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the fiscal year end budget performance projection. Eva Keither. Well, good evening, Welcome. everybody. Um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Eva Keither, um, and I am the Acting uh, VP of Finance. So I'm here today um, to present both the FY24 um, year-end budget performance projection, which is our current fiscal year, and then I'm also presenting our um, budget yeah. assumptions for FY25. So you have two documents and they both kind of look the same. They're pretty colorful. So the first document we're going to be looking at is um, has three columns. It looks like the third, the column to the furthest right is, is a green screen. So um, first up again is our FY24 projection. Um, what you're looking at here, the first column in yellow is our uh, is last year's FY23's um, total actual. Um, the second column in blue is this year's FY24 budget. And the column in green is uh, this year's uh, FY24 projection. So this is the, the column that we're focusing on and we're com comparing to these other two data points. So the first page of this document presents all of our revenue categories. And I didn't plan to spend too much time talking about our revenues as our forecast is strongly indicating that we are on, on target to um, meet or exceed budget on all categories of revenue. Um, 
which, and you can see that we're very close to budget actually, which is what we like to see. Um, there are a couple of categories that are a little bit different and I'll explain um, what those variances have to do with. Um, but at this point in time, most of our rev revenues are very stable and very predictable. So we have a lot of confidence in our rev revenue projection. Um, overall, we're predicting that we're gonna come in 2.8% um, favorable to budget. So about $5 million over our budget. Um, so I just like to comment briefly on row 20, mm -hmm. which is our institutional revenue. Mm -hmm. We are predicting that we're going to um, we're going to exceed this category doing due to interest earnings outperforming our budget um, due to the unstable market, and um, we 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 try to budget conservatively. And FY 23 interest rates went up rather quickly, rather abruptly. And the latest indicators are that interest will decline. We thought we might see a little bit of that this year, and we have seen a little bit of it, but um, the indicators are that it's gonna decline gradually um, and, and into 25. So um, we were, I mean, it's good news for the institution that we were able to see a little bit of additional revenue on that category. Um, the other category that I'd like to draw your attention to is row 24. In row 24, um, we have an other source here presented um, and uh, titled HERF Strategic Reserves. And in this category, as a part of the institution's overall plan for use of the institutional funds, we were awarded um, funds for lost revenue um, to our operating fund and um, in the amount of about $3.5 million um, of lost revenue we were awarded and we allowed that revenue that was recorded as federal revenue in previous years and we allowed that revenue to fall or add to our fund balance. So, um, and it was to be set aside and this was presented by um, Jeff Hollow previously to the board to be set aside for a strategically determined purpose. And there were discussions about this prior to my um, being in this position about using those funds. So the determination of executive leadership was to use these funds to reduce student bad debt that was incurred during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, we thankfully had not only institutional funds, but we had student funds that were awarded, student her funds, and we were able to reduce those um, student accounts and help our students in that manner. But now that we have these institutional funds, um, we are going to use these funds to, we've, we've calculated what debt is still on the books that was incurred by our student students during this period of time. And it's almost, a, it's very close to what these funds, the, the 3.5 million, we have 3.5 million sitting in our reserves that um, we can use to offset those accounts. So um, at this time, uh, COVID relief spending, the HERF and the COVID relief spending is wrapping up. So the institution would like to execute on this commitment to eliminating, um, eliminating these student debts. So that's that piece. Other than that, everything you can see is tracking really close, really close to budget. So that's the revenue side. So on the second page, um, we're presenting our expenditure categories and you're looking at the same three buckets and categories that you're accustomed to seeing. So on the wage, we'll start with wages. Um, we are currently predicting that our wage expenditures will come in a bit over budget. Um, the key drivers uh, are a vacancy savings target that was set set a bit high due to an unusual number of vacant positions that existed when we were developing this budget, as well as labor market volatility. Um, applicant volume was reported to have increased a little bit in 23 and 24 and is, and is slowly continuing to become more favorable to employers. So the bottom line is ultimately we were able to hire more positions in less time this fiscal year than the budget had anticipated. Um, which put us, which, which is looking like it's putting us a little bit over budget. Um, and secondly, the other key driver is um, market adjustments that were done in conjunction with completing our compensation study. So that was a lesser factor, but that definitely was a factor. Um, so I, I just want to point out too that the data that we use to do this projection is actual data through the month of February is the foundation and then we kind of build from there. So there's a lot of, there's literally, you know, four, March, April, May, and June four, June, four months left of the year. So there is going to be some swings, but this is 
this is the time of year that things tend to stabilize and um, when we usually do our formal projection. So um, we'll move on to benefits. So we are predicting also that our benefits budget will come in over budget. Um, we're currently seeing a significant upward trend in the volume of high paying claims. Um, and in the month of February, actually, we had our highest month ever in health insurance claims, which um, we kind of, we usually see that number going up in December, January, in January, but then it starts to come down usually in February because our plan year is on, we're on a calendar year. So um, we are, as you know, part of the WTC um, employee, employee Benefits um, Consortium. So we will benefit the, from the pooling of um, pooling of, of the risk with the other members and also expect some relief from stop loss reimbursement and pharmacy rebates. Um, at this point in time, we're projecting very conservatively here that we're gonna end at about 42.2 million. And with this particular category, most certainly we um, aren't able to always predict with great accuracy here. It's a bit of our a wild card because we are self-insured. But we are looking and looking at those costs daily, um, weekly. Um, so again, again, we have two months left in the year. Um, discretionary budgets is the next category. Um, really pleased to report that our discretionary budget spending is on target to come in favorable to budget. These budgets were set high. If you compare, if you compare our actual spend in 23, we um, spent about um, almost 17 million and we budgeted at 20.2 million. And we are coming in under, under that budget of, at about 18.7 million. Uh, these budgets were set high to, due to inflation. So um, we, we would, but, but we will come in higher than where we, where we, what we spent in 23. Um, our budgets are, we're overly conservative and it appears we're going to finish those budget, that budget within that, the year within budget there. So at this point in time, we are predicting a deficit of 900,000 and depending on where those health insurance claims come in and some of those rebates and stop loss reimbursement, which we are, we are really expecting. And I did, you know, talk with our healthcare administrator and we did a little bit of a forecast before putting this together. So we are predicting some pretty big relief from the stop loss reimbursement and also the pharmacy um, rebates. So that's good news. So um, again, depending on where those health insurance claims come in, we can come in a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, but we are tracking very close to break even. So, does anyone, I, I will pause there. Does anyone have any questions about this? Not direct specifically to you, but when we look at increased um, benefits costs, are we doing any deeper dive into what we're seeing as trending in employee issues and if there's wellness programs or preventative things that we can do to, to help our employees minimize some of that stuff? Yeah, so as we started looking through this, we said we're going to bring our health benefits yeah. committee back together to look okay. at those exact things. Okay, thank you. Director Pence, just a general question: Is it is it common for the colleges to be self insured? Yes, is it, right. It is. It is commonplace. I mean, in the so. in the case in the year that we're experiencing this, this will de definitely benefit us because we are pooling with the other members, and okay. so it's going to create savings for us. But yes, with their, I would the majority of the technical colleges are part of the consortium, um, and they're self insured. Any other, any other questions? Thank you. Um, you mentioned there is a period of time that we will be using um, the reserved uh, HERP um, funding yeah. for student, student debt. What was the period of time? The period of time that we're looking at is the entire span of the pandemic. So we were say able... during COVID. Yes. Yes. So. We, we took another look today to kind of quantify what those debts are. And like I said, we had we had both student and institutional HER funds, and we did use student funds to assist our students. And um, this is the institutional piece. So we are using it to write, to write off bad debt mm -hmm. for whatever's left on the books for during the, that was incurred during by our students during the pandemic. Um, and it works out really well because it's about 
equivalent to um I'm just gonna ask you if he's got a number. It's about three point three million. So um have a question. Sure. Um twenty twenty to what end date would that be? Um it uh I the fall of twenty two. I think it is the last semester we're measuring. Yep. And does that, would the students have to do anything or would the college just like kind of make this transaction itself? Would the students like have to apply or? No, no, this is a bad debt and it's at the college's discretion to, okay. to write off this debt. So no, no action for the students. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Any other questions in the room? Any questions for, from the director? Yeah. Dr. Najib. Dr. Yeah, uh, pull up a question. So we still have the money from the uh, COVID uh, years. We still have it or we already uh, used it? Well, um, we have it. We deliberately, intentionally let it fall to our fund balance for the per and we segregated it from our fund balance with the intention of using it for a strategic purpose. And that purpose all along was to help our students out. So now we are just executing on that um, as we are wrapping up. Yeah. I mean, the HERF, all of the HERF reporting is finalizing. We're at the end. So, and my understanding that COVID fund used for the like cover for the employees. Um, but can we use it also for the student bad debt? Well, the funds that we were awarded that went to, to the institution have to be spent in accordance with how we spend our operating funds. So we're able to, um, we, we determine allowance and allowance for bad debt and write off bad debts every year based on the age of the age of, um, the debts, okay. um, and in this case, you know, we have, we're going to use that discretion during that period of time to write off those student debts that were incurred. So it really, it, it, it benefits both the institution and our students. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of the expenses expect, I mean, you can use this fund for that expenses then. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. The, uh, finally, the, uh, what do we do with the deficit now? 900,000 deficit. What's good? what the procedure what do we, how we take care of it well um we don't i mean it's a projection at this point we i can tell you that we are we we are looking at as we look at our forthcoming budget i mean the areas that we were over in are wages and benefits so um a good deal of focus will be placed on staffing and position control position prioritization possibly freezing positions identifying positions that we're going to delay filling of the position. So that's really what we need to focus on for the forthcoming budget. And then um, we will, as Dr. Martin had mentioned, we are also exploring possible health plan design changes depending on the data and the forecasts that um, we're gonna be evaluating as we plan for our renewal in January. So we have a renewal in January and we have preliminary numbers on what that renewal rate is but this is the time of year that we can look at those plans. I mean, those are the two areas that we, you know, we overspent our budget, or it looks like we're gonna overspend our budget. We still don't know. Um, we don't know, but we're tracking so close to break even, um, but we're already taking action to um, kind of mitigate that going forward. Do we use uh, the reserve for that or no? If we don't, if we couldn't uh, take care of it, do we use the reserve? Well, um, when you have a deficit, you do. I mean, it does. You it go, does affect the reserve. Yes. Yeah, it's affected. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Any other questions? I had I had a quick question. Uh, thank you for your report, Eva. It's good to see us coming close to those numbers right now. I was wondering, and excuse me, because my numbers are small. I'm traveling right now, but given that we had a couple of kind of windfalls with the interest rates and the, you know, the extra 2.5 million coming in, and we already had a conservative budget for this year. How is that impacting our planning for next year? It sounds like we're going to have to really be thoughtful about that because it's a big amount that came in unexpectedly. Absolutely. 
100%. Yeah, we're, like I said, we really have to focus on positions and how we're going to fill them and um, how we're, you know, our approach to that. And we're really going to have to focus on our health plan and really going to have to look at um, possible plan design changes, possible, we, we definitely are taking this very seriously because you're absolutely right. Um, we did have that windfall with the interest, but, and again, um, we, we have four months of the year left to go. So we might, we might not, you know, we might not have a deficit to report at the end of the year, but certainly we are planning um, very um, you know, aggressively for next year. Thank you. Director Burris. When was the last time we had a deficit? Um, it's been, well, I've been here 10 years and we haven't had one since I've been here. So. Director Baker. Where in here are, is institutional revenue, is that where we would see grants that come in that affect programming? Um, no, that would be, what you're looking at here is our general fund or our Just, operating fund. Okay. So that would be in a different fund okay. altogether. But we can see some offset if grants, you know, help us cover definitely some instructional, like we've got the big STEM grant and that yeah. I know goes to programming or, you know, whatever. So, um, right. So that can help offset, correct? Definitely. Those okay. will definitely be direct offset to the general fund. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next is community education. And Dr. King, I think you're. Oh, I'm sorry. You got one more. One more. My so, slide. So there is another document that you have, and it has a pink column. It's right. the one yeah. leader. Yeah. So, um, so this is uh, this is our budget planning assumptions. Um, our budget planning process begins with um, evaluating our funding sources. So, and in doing so, we are able to establish the boundaries of what our budget will allow. So really what you're looking at in this one page document is our revenues. Um, and so a key assumption that drives many of our funding sources, our revenue sources is our FTE target. And our FTE target for FY25 is 8650. So that's a little bit less than a 2% increase over this current current year. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through these categories here. Um, row 10, tax levy, we're expecting to receive an additional 1.5 million. This trend has continued over the past like six, seven years. I keep thinking it's gonna go up, but it doesn't. So. Again, in conservative budgeting, we're gonna add another 1.5 million for tax levy. Um, in our, our biggest funding source, which is state aid, you can see that in the column to the far right, which is our um, what we're predicting for next year. Our state aid is not expected to grow very much. You can see it's really gonna go from 84.2 um, to 84.4, which, has to do with the fact that we're really not increasing our FTEs too much. We're only increasing our FTEs by 150 FTEs. So um, that's what drives at, um, state aid is, is, is uh, those FTEs. Same with the tuition revenue. Um, so in, in rows 14 and 16, we WTCS approved an increase in our tuition rates of 2.26%. You can see, I mean, it's easy to see that in the green column, which is what our, we're projecting this year, compared to the pink column for rows 14 and 16, you can see that not to, we're not really going to be receiving much additional income um, from this source either. But we are we are expecting an additional 1.2 million um, in in tuition revenue. Um, the other uh, the other thing the other category that I would like to point out is institutional revenue. Again, we reduced. Um, that is where we have our interest earnings and we reduce that again to reflect the, you know, just to be conservative as we um, we know that the interest rates are gonna go down. And if we budgeted at 6 million, we might not hit that target. So we, um, that's the other area that kind of changed a little bit. Um, and then in row 24, again, you can see those HERF um, strategic reserves, uh, the last million we will use use there as well so that um that is also factored into the other sources or the total revenue sources that we have for fy25 um the the main thing i want to point out in in this planning 
period that we're in and we're really we have all of our budget our draft budget put together but it's an we have everything plate that we have all of our rosters we it's kind of all in we kind of rolled our budgets forward and updated them and um we we'll get to that next time we we talk when we talk about our draft budget i believe next month but what we're seeing here on the revenue side is our total revenue really isn't going up very much from this year um if you look at row 27 or even row 26, you can see that um, our revenue actually is declining, is expected to, to decline from um, this year, the current year to next year. And that has to do with the very low, moderate increase that we're expecting in FTEs. Um, and it has to do with bringing those interest earnings estimates down a little bit to be conservative. And it also kind of, it reflects those hurt those HERF other source dollars that were that are not going to, you know, we had 2.5 last year and one this year. So again, the challenge is is great for the forthcoming year because our we're not going to be seeing as much revenue, um, or we're not going to be seeing much of much of an increase. In fact, it's looking like a small de decrease at this point. So, any questions? Any question, uh, Director Moro Kundi? Yes, can you um go into the weeds a little bit about the total revenue reduction? This one point six percent. Sure. The, well, the revenue the reduction has to do with the fact that we're not if we're not expecting increases in state aid, which is our biggest revenue source, which mm -hmm. are because we're only um, budgeting a very small increase in our FTEs for next year. So that increase is very small. And the decrease on the institutional revenue side to bring that institutional revenue down to a more conservative level for interest earnings, we had the windfall this year. So you're seeing that comparison. You're seeing an unnatural number of 6 million for institutional revenue for this year. And that's gonna go back to the normal level of 4.3 million next year. So that's, that's the biggest piece of it right there. And the other sources like tuition and state aid aren't going to go up very much because our FTEs aren't predicted to go up very much. So um, there's not going to be, a, you know, it's not going to be the significant increase in, in revenue that we might see if we increased our FTEs more. So this is a projection by the college. Uh, this is our, well, this document is our budget planning assumption. So this is really the first pass at our revenue budget. And we're, we are, this is pretty solid. I mean, um, these numbers are pretty fixed at this point in time and they're defined by our revenue sources that state aid that's pretty predictable. Tax levy, pretty predictable. It's all very pr pretty predictable. So this is our revenue budget for next year. And now we have to build a budget. Now we know what the boundary of our budget is for next year. So now we have to build a budget that fits um, into this, that, you know, this, this defines what we can, what we have to work with essentially. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Najib, do you have a question? Uh, just uh, like looking at the budget for next year without really knowing how much exactly revenue we're gonna have and how much expenditure we're gonna spend, it's still the we the benefit is still uh, difficult to see how we're gonna be doing. For we next need to year? for next year. Do we know how much exactly the uh, the revenue gonna be and and what we're gonna spend it on uh, to see if the budget will be uh, be good or not? Well, we are right now. We're looking at we're looking at just the revenue side. This is typically what we present. It's it's um, mm -hmm. it's for planning purposes. Again, we look at the revenue side and we understand what our funding sources are because it establishes the boundaries of our budget. Mm -hmm. When we know how much we have to work for work with, then we can take and continue to um, develop our the expenditure side so that we can balance our budget. So, so that's yet. So, mm -hmm. so we could get more revenue. We don't know if we can get more revenue or the, we might spend more or less also. We don't know how it's going to be. Well, it's a prediction. It's a, yeah, a, prediction. Budget, a budget is a plan based on as much information as we have. So it is a it is a bit of a, you know, it's a prediction, but it's fairly, um, we're, we're fairly confident in these numbers, in these revenue numbers. Director Baker. Did you, 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 oh, you go first? Okay. So this is the first time the board takes a look at this in our process of planning the budget. Correct. And the um, 
uh, you know, finance department goes through all the numbers to show us everything that they can tell us in the assumptions that this is how much money, I mean, the tax levy gets set in the fall, but we got a pretty good sense of what we're going to get from it. Um, the, uh, some, someone way smarter than me about numbers a long time ago told me budgets are about choices. So as we move down this path, we will know where the guardrails are. And then we as a board get the opportunity to take a look at the choices that we have to make in order to stay within those guardrails, keep the college sound and deliver programming to our students. So we're like at the first step of that, where we're learning where some of the guard, where we think the guardrails are. And there will be more to come as we develop this process. Does that sound fair to you? That's great. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yes. First. My question was, um, at what point do we visit uh, if we have a surplus where those funds will go? So my question is to you. Oh, you. uh, at, at, you're talking about for the current fiscal year? Yes. Basically at, at the end. Okay, so end, very... June, end of June. Yeah, that's probably about right. No, we do our year end and there's a lot of adjustments we do. So probably have a real final look by about August, September. Okay, August or September. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next is community education. Good evening again, Chair Foley, members of the board. Welcome back, Mark. Well, thanks, long sir. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, forgive me, I do think we have a very short update. You didn't receive this, and my apologies. Uh, Dr. Isahaku is out unexpectedly this evening. Uh, otherwise, I would have had this to you. Um, I'll just preface to, you know, I've been coming alongside this since mid-fall, and I think my commitment to you is this, in the next three months, we're going to close this out because it's been sitting. So we're making progress. I'll give you those updates, but we've got to close out the items so we can help support programs and be able to demonstrate back to you what is the progress that we've made. Okay. Um, in terms of the steps that you see here, uh, these are, again, the categories that we've been uh, going over, each, each of the categories as it relates to that CEAP committee that formed over a year ago, right? And so the outcomes, these are brief in each category. I'll focus here on number one, which is that um, we've been doing a remodel of the Walker Square space. If you've not been there, it isn't necessarily everything we do, again, related to community education. Remember, it's just a facet. It's a one site for our entire program, but it does house a large part of some of our ESL or ELL programming. Um, in addition to MCT, but we're doing a remodel on that first floor. And that remodel is really based on what you might have heard us talk about the one-stop shop. It's, and it's really an alignment of the best services that you can get right when you walk in that front entry. It requires both re, you know, reallocation of space and adjustment, but also staffing. Like what are the, who are the staff in alignment to do the work? Um, uh, we'll say we made uh, the adjustments to the spaces themselves and what we're going to be doing on the first, it's called the second floor, but it's really the first as you come in, is uh, um, a setup in an entire testing situation. So we'll have testing on the first floor and testing on the fourth floor. We're going to do it in both locations. One of the decisions that was made is because Walker Square is prominent and it's growing is that students not only need CE or ELL testing, front, middle, and end, they also, we need broad-based testing for the community. So a student can also go to Walker's now when we finish this to get testing broadly for any testing assessment that they may want, as well as ELL testing. First floor, we'll have a test person there as well to monitor that. And then the front end, and there's a three-part office, will be most likely a three-part team that includes what you might have heard called out before as an admission specialist, at the front end, they do the front end intake. The secondary person will be an academic support person. And the third person will be a person that does advising. So they have three distinct roles. That's the alignment that the team's been working on in terms of who are the people that will serve the students walking in the door. And again, uh, second floor, anybody coming in. So they could see prominently, we have mostly CE students, but we have MCT students. So they'll see both. And an advisor could also then support a student who simply says, I found walkers, I walk past, I'm interested in the lead pathway, and they could also support them. So the remodel is just about done. They're going to be putting the testing stations in, and we're realigning the staff right now. And those are conversations with people about the roles they have, and they may be in different spaces in the building. That's walkers. Um, one, two, one stop. Again, remember, we said we're looking at it at all locations. They may not be relevant at all locations based on the size. 
right? Because some of the, the campuses are a little smaller. Oak Creek actually has our largest CE population. We're currently undergoing a renovation there. Like what they called now for some time uh, the main street renovation. So we've reallocated spaces and put uh, place staff, that whole admissions team in another location as they're doing a remodel. Coming alongside the remodel are three parallel teams that will come around them, the pathway officers that will most likely be um, uh, serve um, MCT and then a CE pathway office. And again, it's a co-location hub model, one stop, but that's right in the middle of a renovation. It's a major renovation. They barely kicked it off. We are looking at trying to start the pathway portion of that earlier because it's a carve out. Similar model to this, same setup, similar staffing pattern as we move them through. Okay? Mequon, we're holding out yet right now in terms of the size of the operation there. And again, West Dallas is a little bit smaller looking at that as we move forward. So one stop, those, that's the work we're doing currently. Again, remember some construction projects do take quite a bit of time. Uh, a lot of lag time and product coming in, but Walker's is the first one and then Oak Creek will be next. Any questions on that before I move on to the next? Okay, staff shortages. Um, again, we've commented on this and they have them in two categories. So when we say staff, it's not faculty. Um, we, we have identified that from a ratio perspective, we'd like to see um, some more staff in each of the areas, not equally at all campuses related to support. I just described this, admission specialist, academic support, and broad-based advising. There are a couple of other positions, either prominent ones that are supporting our students and even then that testing person. So that includes at all campuses, right, that four-part team, testing, admission specialist, academic support, advising. And so we're missing one or two of those people. Technically, we have, you know, as you can imagine, if you've seen your hiring report, we I think brought on 35 people in this last month. We're working on hiring regularly, bringing people alongside. It could even be redeployments of staff. More recently, we just hired two testing persons out at Mequon. That was a vestige of something that we had as staffing. So as the staff are coming on, what we're doing is looking at caseload and identifying to reallocate. So one of those testers that just got hired will be placed at another location based on size of operation. Okay. Um, faculty shortages has probably come up the most. Uh, and the first bullet is a repeat of what you've heard before, but I want to remind you all, we did have two faculty retirements in the current year. One was in GED. We're going to reallocate both those positions to uh, full-time faculty roles in, in ESL, ELL. Okay. Second bullet. Um, uh, Dr. Isahaku had mentioned this past year, we had temporary funding that helped float the LTE for full time. He'd asked and been told that we have access to at least request those funds. He has not received positive response yet that we back third for third bullet, but there it's likely, but not. And so the third bullet is we have amidst our process now, part of our annual process is to ask for full time faculty. So a lot of the deans do that. People are, have the tendency to do the retirement right around now. And so everybody's asking. So we have four full-time faculty ELL requests coming alongside in parallel to bullet two. And again, this is getting us back to the level that is appropriate related to the size of the population. ELL and broadly our GED, our other high school programs as well, right? It's not just ELL. Okay? So those are faculty shortages and the work we're currently doing. That second bullet, or excuse me, the first bullet, we're right in process. It's posted. We're working on that hiring right now. The next two, we're getting ready to work on that in terms of our regular process at the college and then posting uh, for hire. The goal would be post, hire, um, 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 offer within spring semester. They would start in the fall. Questions on bullet three or number three. Okay. Uh, number four, I know this has come up before and there's a lot of questions and consternation around this. I appreciate some of the questions which say things like, We've commented that there's been a response from the state, for example, which is, yes, you can remove that, that indicator. And the flip side of that is, yes, you can, but by the way, you're actually required to report that data, so you have a problem. So by law, you're okay, but by the way, you still need to turn it in, right? One, two, remember our two-step process on the front end for our, uh, our assessment for our, our, this population was that we moved very quickly in a good way to fully online, web-based services for all students. We had a one size, what we discovered through the process is for the, this particular population that is both second language acquisition as well as technology, that this fully online admissions application does not work for them. That was our assessment. We need to move backward. What that really means is we're moving backward to a by hand or more manual process. Staff intervention, sitting alongside students, actively working with them to engage them in a two-step process 
a first portion is four to five questions, get them in the system to get them moving. And then as they move into the semester, you can complete the application. It's going to require a lot of intervention on our part. So it's a much more manual process. It requires humans sitting alongside of people rather than us telling everybody go to the online. And so we have to design the system I mentioned earlier with staffing, which is we have people in place to sit alongside the students so that we can guide them through that process. We're still working on that, that part where the state said it's okay to lift this requirement, but at the same time, we're trying to figure out how to get it, it some of it in place for reporting purposes. And again, reporting through TABE, our testing system, gets us the funding. So as we report on our outcomes related to students making progress, we have to do that to get the funds in order to run part of the program that's based on uh, grant funding, okay? Uh, questions on four? Testing, you've heard me comment a little bit about that. We're not fully staffed. Nine, nine total assessment technicians district-wide, those assessment techs, testing technicians serve broadly. All students, not just this population, and you're hearing me comment earlier about We've added an additional one at Walker Square, and then we're trying to distribute them across the campuses so that they're supporting broadly, again, all students, but also this population. Um, and we are working at extensions into evening hours. And remember, you've heard a little bit about back and forth of how long the, the, the net is, how long will they stay in place? Like how late will they work? And again, remember some of the tests, if you say you show up at seven o'clock at night, um, you can't really show up at seven and take a test because that means the test might last till 10 o'clock and we don't have test staff till 10 o'clock, right? So we're working on that flexible overlapping schedule. In some cases where you have full-time, part-time, you have staff working where you have a full-time and a part-timer so they can overlap. But again, also remember a lot of our testing situations require two people to be in place. Those are the requirements by uh, how we're setting up our testing situation, okay? Um, and then I would say transition and retention. I don't really have any updates on six, seven, or eight. The pathway, again, was an item as a vestige of something out as the outcome of the, the task force, but it's really about that one-stop shop, and it's about staffing models. That's really what they were asking for. But we leave it there for posterity, just as a remembrance of that was a category. Uh, that's where we are as an update this evening. Questions in the room? Correct. When will we get that uh, report, that paper report? I can get it out to you okay. after the meeting. Any other questions in the room for defense? When you say testing, are you testing after they are enrolled and working and doing their their curriculum? Mm -hmm. Are you saying testing to go into to direct them to other pathways? Not, not specifically from a testing perspective, not technically. So there's two things around testing, broad-based testing for the college. We could do GED testing. We could do placement testing in general, which we don't really do, but like we have some standardized uh, payment testing. On this side, most of the work is ELL testing. It's the most robust uh, developed testing process I've ever seen. And it's usually at the very beginning, you test that student to assess what what level of ELL they will go into. There is then intermediate testing as they move through, they're consistently tested. The front end is by our test staff, test technicians. The middle is by faculty. So as you're assessing the students, you're actually interacting with them, you're testing them. The end point is back to the testing staff again for predominantly that ELL population. Could there be some kind of testing to get to see their aptitude to go into the trades or or something that would be a different kind of test uh, that's actually a good question and that's a part of a larger conversation i think i've had a little bit here at other colleges which is you do some front-end assessment of uh, sometimes that's like a career or orientation test right so we do that through career services what what is your app to do what are you interested in those are interest inventories mm -hmm. but some of that i've seen at other colleges is really about readiness of the student to participate in a program in general right whether it be online in a tech trade or general but also their kind of inclination to participate in the activities of education. So you have an assessment of that, like, you know, factors that come out about their general readiness. Dr. Martin is around. Yeah. And, and then we had a conversation about bringing a mobile lab. We have a STEM yeah. mobile lab that has a lot of hands-on activities as well as a career day, a number of career days so that we can find out what the students' interests are and aptitudes are uh, so that we can think about planning uh, to actually have programs that, as they requested, that may have it built right in. We're going to look at another model as well. So we're going to be doing more work on this as we move forward. And if you saw the end of your slide deck 
on guided pathways, which is rather substantive, almost all of those eight, you had eight components, you saw career and jobs come up every single time. So it's a really good question. Uh, last question, how covered is the cost of this within our within our uh, <laughs> grants and funding and things like that? I think we're going to do the best we can to make sure it's within the context of the current budget we have. It's the best answer I have for you. We are doing, like I said, we have a process right now where um, all full-time faculty, it's, it happens uh, regularly through the year, but it, at this point of the year, you generally have a larger set of people mm -hmm. that ask for positions. Their set of four are up in the mix to be requested, and they have to be responded to within the context of the larger budget. So this may come up as a higher priority than the other subset of other positions across the college, and they have to fit inside the budget that we have. Because I could see this as you're projecting down the road, this to be a real, you know, and the enrollment could be in in big in waves, and and you know, really hard to hard to budget for. But, Potentially, which is why you'll see, remember that LTE position is a full-time faculty equivalent, but not permanent. And so those are roles sometimes we put into place because it effectively gives a full-timer a good wage to be here, but doesn't commit us for, let's say, in perpetuity, right? So you'll see some of that in some of our presentation where we use the term LTE, but the full-time faculty role permanent is one we're also considering when we see the size of the population and we're trying to monitor. It's a good question, which is, we see the bump, it's increased. It's increased now over a two year period. And will it continue? We're trying to identify the factors that they give us that indication. Migration in, size of the population of the city, things like that. As you are sitting in an acronym free zone. Yes, sir. Uh, LTE's long-term employee. Limited. Limited. Limited, Limited term, term employee. Thank you. Sorry for that. It's okay. My, acronym free zone. Director Burris. Can we get this? Um... Slide or report back on the screen from the question, please. Which one? The one that he just read for us. That's what I can Yeah. Mm -hmm. My question really is going to pertain to the the application portion. I know that I made a, a suggestion prior to to you being in this position. Um, uh, not the last me, you mean uh, a year ago? Yes. Oh, got it. Um, I suggested that we utilize uh, our uh, our students or faculty to make a video so that they can kind of have what the the application entails. So students would not be selecting the residence, residency question um, incorrectly. Do we not think that that's a possibility? Instead of, you know, making sure that there's a, a faculty next to every student, but some type of blurb on the side or even next to the person when they're taking the, doing the application to explain certain things so that staff aren't inundated with the process, because I think it's simpler ways than just saying, hey, we have to have like a one-on-one -on -one support with everybody in order to make this work. Um, Good comment. I think we'll look into it. And when I make that comment about what we're suggesting, um, if the larger body of information that resulted from the assessment that came out, uh, that resulted in my statement, is a reflection of, a movement away from one size fits all. Um, so what I'm responding to is now not a one size fits all. What you're actually going to have is a set, a, a set of opportunities that include you have a person to guide you. Oh, by the way, it looks as though you have very heightened capability. You sit there and take care of yourself. Online video, like it's going to look at, and we're doing that with every single student. That's the options we want to have. Every student may have different needs. So we want to respond that way. And it's a good suggestion. I'll take a look at that as a suggestion as well. Yeah, I mean, it's obvious that we need we need the information to report, but I think we can look at different ways to get the information. We're still making it simpler for the students to do so. 
this has been one of the ones that I've been concerned about for so long because students are, you know, incurring fees with that error. Yep. Um, and it just seems like it is one of the low hanging fruit and we still just have not been able to get the hang of that. And I would certainly like to see that. Um, I know that starting your statements, you said that we're going to be able to clear this up in three months or so. Um, a, a lot of the these bullet points says either no update or this one in particular says, I do not know how you will respond to this question if it's a raise. Yeah, that's very clear about Sadiq writing to me, yeah. right? So, you know, for, for clarity, that's why we didn't send it out. He got it to me and he had to, he had to leave. I, you know, I, to your comment, um, I'll, I'll say this when I say my three months. This one in particular, I want to be clear too. We may not be able to solve that in three months. I'm going to be, I mean, it's really about how the student information system is set up. Are we using an application process? Are we allowed to actually change that app? It's related to a common app. We may have some, you know, some steps to go through, but part of us putting in place staff is that we're hoping then to the earlier comment, have people to come along students to support them to navigate the complexity of it. We did not have that. That was a recommendation. We may not have all these pieces exactly in place. That's a resetting a student information system and in an application process that's used in multiple ways. We'd like to think it's clean and easy. It is not a clean thing to fix. It's just not. So, um, I, I can't report more on that. That would not be mine to to respond to. I'd be, you know, we'd be commenting about work of our uh, chief information officer and our technology support team. And but I, I don't want to go too much into the weeds there. I'd have to pull them in for more detail. But I will continue. I'll dig in to explore that further to find out where we are on a timeline. I, I think it would be useful to have the the tech side's input on that timeline yeah. and impress upon them that whatever they say in the first instance, it needs to be shorter. Um, you know, they, they need to give this some priority. I don't know if they are now, but we need to make sure they are giving it priority. Uh, Director Burris, I, I'm not sure I understood what you were proposing. So, uh, so let, let me ask a question about that. So, uh, I have been places where I was there to fill out forms and there is playing on a closed circuit um, uh, loop. Um, a, a person or multiple people interacting on the screen, you know, up on the wall, so in many people in the room can see it, describing what this process you're about to engage in is like, and there can be questions. Well, you know, will I be asked about residency might be a question and there's a response right there that could solve some of the problems. Now you sit down and say, uh, uh, you know, is this person capable of uh, filling this out on the computer themselves? You may have eliminated the biggest barrier just by having this playing and saying what this is about, what it's not about. I don't know if that was what you were suggesting or- Yes, in a, in a sense, that's what I was, I was yeah, suggesting. In different languages, it, yeah, absolutely. It just allows, um, staff to continue processing without having to sit next to someone to individually do each application because when I raised the issue that wasn't I wasn't trying to indicate another part of the process mm -hmm. we'll put that on faculty I wanted it to be something that can be interactive a video or a FAQ sometimes there's like a blurb that has an example of it on the application that just says hey, this does not mean are you a non-resident of the U.S. It just says, where do you live as it relates to the state of Wisconsin? So something as simple as that. When I originally posed the question, though, many months ago, it was said that we just could not make any changes. Mm -hmm. Then we got the update that we can make changes, you just need to report. So if we can make the changes, let's just find a way to make the change and report it out. That's my hope. Okay. Any other questions in the room? Any other questions from the directors online? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any new business for the next meeting? I just would like to see if the board can get a refresher on what we're doing with HSI to recruit more students. Okay. And um, what we're not doing or what we could do as a board to help with that. 
you know, I've been on this board for almost five years and I have not seen that number go up. It's actually going down. Yeah, as I understand it, we have to recruit proportionately more Spanish speakers than the general rise in the population. Mm -hmm. And since they're counted in that general population, it's yeah. you're chasing your own tail. Yeah. Um, but okay, so uh, we'll ask for that. Hopefully um, we can do it. I mean, if it's a goal, then we should be working towards that goal. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And, you know, just saying that we're growing at the same pace, it's not necessarily the right, I think. Any yeah, other sorry. topics? Okay, you well, know, yeah. Down. So just um, uh, I I in the public comments, I was distressed to hear some of this stuff around the administ. Uh, what was it? The admissions specialists. You know that we called a meeting the you know eleven o'clock the night before, telling people their jobs were changing. Whatever. I I I'd like to see some clear. I'd like to hear some clarity on that and. Um, you know, I, I, that doesn't necessarily have to come back to us as a board, but it could just be in report like, yeah, to us yeah. to yeah. let us know what happened with this job classification and the individuals involved. We're not a heartless institution, and I don't want any of our employees to feel like we are. We shouldn't be. So um, I, I'd like to just hear about that. And then the other thing, um, the, the first speaker had sort of a, a long story about our student complaint process. And clearly she had run into some roadblocks in it. Um, and she was very, you know, ex explicit in sort of describing all of that. Uh, I'm not really well informed on that process. And I would like to understand that better and what recourse students have when they feel that they've been treated unfairly. Um, I think that that'd be worth us knowing more about. Yeah, we've also heard uh, in the past about this uh, having two separate adjudications about an incident that they think they're done because they've dealt with the first one, but now there's the second one and cuts them off from something else. I don't know what that's about, but I think we'd, I'd like to hear more about what that's about and how we can either explain that or eliminate that from the process. Anything else? <laughs> More. We get the automotive program on. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um. So, uh, hopefully, this is the right place to do it. Um, I, I, I have a very, very proud uncle moment that I wanted to to discuss briefly. Um, we were talking with uh, the award winning folks who did the uh, uh the, the production about our uh. Uh, live shooter event and and I was recently informed that we have some MATC students who are in our filming and, and um, visual arts program who won a Wisconsin Broadcasting Award and uh, for uh, the episode that they did on MATC Now episode 860 um, which was done on December 11th 2023 and one of them happens to be my sister's youngest daughter. Oh. And um, so Leslie Garcia Ramirez, Shannon O'Dwyer, and Sade Moore Beeman um, won uh, the, the WBA Student Award for Excellence for yeah. TV public affairs in the talk show that they did for um, with Milwaukee PBS MATC for MATC Now episode that they did. And... Um, uh, she didn't know that she was going to win it. Otherwise, she would have invited us to go and see her receive the award. But um, this is some work that's being done by our students here at MATC. And uh, cool. point of clarification, I did not know that. <laughs> so okay. thank you for bringing that up. That is an excellent team. And they really do good work. So okay. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for bringing that up. Great, 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 great. And uh, she doesn't like me to call her sugar in uh, public. <laughs> My sugar was a part of that uh, that that team. So, awesome! Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for bringing our attention during the first. I know I have brought this up um, in the past, um, and I'm I'm gonna still press the issue, especially after my visit today to the early vote site and um, only having eighty voters uh, during this early vote cycle. I want the college to have a more um, 
a stronger voice in advocating that our students, faculty, and staff are um, participating in elections. I don't know how we're going to do that. Um, we know that we have uh, several important elections coming up, and I would like to um, just work with the college on trying to make sure that we're engaging students more. I know what that looks like. But... Okay. Anything else? Any suggestions for new business from the directors online? Hearing no, thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 No. So the executive Opposed, committee is going to hang around. We're getting to the floor. Yeah. Yeah. Nice thing done. Thor is good. You know, my son is with corn. He has so many little. Yeah. He's got one hanging from his. Yeah, yeah. Take one of them. So, 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 think about it this way. Works. Is this is a magnet. He's a, no, I don't I just think it's a but I think you know, oh, so, part of their evaluation <laughs> plans. July, does it help? They the will be. Yeah, yes. oh, like Well, that's true, too. And they want to know that's where it takes you. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And a lot of licenses don't have Well, I guess so. It was we had five minutes ago. Somebody was gone. Oh my gosh, so fabulous. And how are you now? Just a celebration. Are you doing this weekend? Are you going to have a Hey, Tina. Just wanted to let you all know you're still on. Oh, Carol, you can turn it off. Okay, so.